to go? I'm ready. Miguel. I have curiosity here with all these um, Well, items. let's get into it. Okay. What do you want to know? <laughs> um, well, I want to know if there's meaning behind them or they're just like, you know. It's all relatively intentional. I mean, a lot of the, one of the things when you run a podcast, you get all the books in the mail ahead of time. Ah, uh, right. And I interview a lot of authors, so I get a lot of cool books. So a lot of these are from guests or they're just things that I'm interested in. Right. Yeah, um, yeah Scott, you know Scott, right? Yeah, you do stuff with really Charity well. Water. Mm-hmm. I have not had David Lynch on, but I would like to. Mm. And um, have you read Ego is the Enemy no. by Ryan Holiday? No. I was wondering whether you might have met him along the way because Ryan was the um, head of marketing for American Apparel. Oh, really? Back in the day. And I actually, he texted me this morning about something else. And I said, hey, Miguel's coming over to do the podcast. You guys must have met at some point. He was very young at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've been racking my brain trying to remember whether we met. We must have at some point, but he just didn't remember. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say the same way. Right. May may have, but you know, (laughs) it was wild times. Well, let's get into the wild times, man. It's been quite a journey. I think when I think about WeWork and and everything that you've accomplished and, and, you know, your mission, it seems like every once in a while, maybe just a couple times in a generation, there's a really great idea that happens to coincide with a shift in culture and then like some fairy dusting of, of timing and a lot of hard work and persistence, of course, that kind of uh, creates the foundation for something so, you know, seismically impacting as what you've created with WeWork. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like yeah, because I, 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 I think about like the way people work today is not the way people work in general, like when I was a kid. Right, and so this idea that you had, it wasn't you weren't the first person to come up with the idea of co-working that existed, but you did it at scale and in a way that really um, leveraged this change in our relationship to the workplace and work in general, with the kind of emergence of this freelance culture and um, how the internet has allowed people to to you know do what they do remotely, even when they work for large companies. Yeah. And it's the the reason why I responded to that. Um, I guess feeling a little bit overwhelmed is that uh, it still feels like we're so in it, like we're in that mm. moment where the change is still happening and evolving, and it feels, um, I guess, to me, still rough in that way. I don't know how to describe that, but it, it feels still like we're in the journey so much that when it when when you think of it as like that as a shift, that almost seems like a conclusion or a change that's perceptible. I think we're still right in the heart of that change. Like we're still mm-hmm. so close to what's going on that um that to hear it described that way, I mean obviously it feels great and I appreciate it, but I also feel like we have so much more to do. Yeah. But just for perspective, I mean, this thing only started in 2008, which might seem like a lifetime ago to you, but really just wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And I think whereas in the early days, it was like, cool idea. Um, Now it's like, wow, you know, you walk into, Uh you go arriving in Jakarta, seeing the WeWork sign on a big tower, you know, walking in and feeling this incredible warmth and like, vibe of people feeling happy and connected to each other that's when it's like surreal clicks into like Uh real very quickly and it feels really good what i hear in that is is the idea of community which seems to be kind of the lifeblood for you i mean that that theme permeates throughout your life and really uh you know in my imagination at least is the life force that kind of ignites, you know, all of this for you. Yes, you're scaling, you're in all these cities, you know, this is a huge organization that you're now, you know, at the top of. Um, But at its core, this is about trying to connect people. For sure. And it's interesting because that is still my deepest interest. So what's interesting when it comes to the scale is that you can look at the business overall and there's something interesting and impressive and you, know, you value it 
on a large scale, it's like, uh-huh. wow, that's achieving something. But to me in the day to day, what I really care about is connecting with people. And so, for example, I mean, we came to LA this week and what I did this morning was what we call lead, leader circle, which was, I think about 15 of us sitting in a circle for two hours telling stories about our lives, about where we come from, about how we connect our past to who we are now. And that's the stuff that I love. I mean, there was tears, there were, you know, laughs, there were, you know, there was inspiration. And that's the stuff that like, I'm like, this is why Uh I do it. You know, it's, those are the things that I feel really fulfilled by. And like, um, and it's, and it, and that, I don't think, I hope that never goes away. I mean, that's like, what. Yeah. That's the part that just feels so good. And so that's the part that I hunger to actually do that really well. And I, we talk about it all the time, like, how do we not waste our time when we bring people together? Because if you have an opportunity to connect, don't waste it. Yeah. You know, how can you be intentional and structure these interactions in a way that will, you know, allow people to, you know, deepen their their relationship to each other. Yeah, and in that way, one thing that's really interesting, one of the struggles that we have, and we've designed WeWork for that connection. When we're outside of the WeWork setting and we, like, for example, you know, the team, like, booked a restaurant for Uh a dinner tomorrow night. And now we know that most restaurants suck for connecting, for really connecting. I mean, maybe if you're two people and you can really sit face-to-face, but if you're six and you're on the end of the table or, you know, you're eight you're definitely not connected as a group. Right. It's just not possible. And if you're an introvert and you're at the end of the table, you sit there, you know, twiddling your thumbs. Exactly. And full of anxiety. And it could be three hours (laughs) of that, right? And that's like torture, I think, if you're that person. So what is the we eat plan for addressing that? (laughs) Well, I think the first thing is for us to actually be, like you said, purposeful about those decisions. So we're actually looking for a new reservation. Because, of course, when I come to town, people are like, oh, let's take Miguel to the cool restaurant. I don't care about the cool restaurant at all. I want to go to the place that actually is quiet, that's conducive to conversation, where we can actually feel like we're sharing our time together mm-hmm. in a way that's valuable. And so that's that's the design process that we're working on. So we're actually in the process today of looking for a yeah. different place to, to hold that so that we, because we know we failed a lot. Like we've gone and I've actually left those, some of the, the dinners being like angry that we wasted those three hours because I didn't feel yeah. connected. And so I aspire every time to make that time valuable. I was at uh, a friend's birthday party uh, a couple weeks ago it was a small dinner party, 20 people, all at one long table. And in an effort to address that very issue, that problem, um, the host, the, the guy whose birthday it was said, here's what we're gonna do. Everyone's gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna nominate one person to be kind of the moderator. And we're all gonna go around, we're gonna introduce ourselves and we're gonna talk about like what's top of mind right now for each of us or what we're working on or like something that you know we feel strongly about. And then we'll kind of collate all of these ideas and figure out what's most interesting to talk about as a group. And that way it integrated everybody into the conversation. So there was no marginalized person at the end of the table. And then it just went on its own way, but it was actually kind of amazing. And I did leave that experience feeling like I had had a meaningful exchange with every single person at that dinner. So it is like that. How can you bring an intentionality to this rather than just sit down like, hey, how was your day? What are you doing? Right. And how often do you have that experience where, you know, you happen to speak to the person who was sitting next to you, but then Mm -hmm. no one else, you know, or maybe one or two other people. Or you're like, you're feeling bad because you're ignoring that person because you're talking to that person. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that there's, um, that intentionality is important on multiple levels, but I do you think that um, it can be awkward? And so I think for me, that's been a, a something that, you know, I, I try not to take for granted that I'm in a position where I can say things and do things because of my whatever position or success or whatever it might be where people won't Everybody just has blow to me listen. off. Yeah, yeah, like to some extent, yeah. like, like I can actually be a convener because of that. And mm-hmm. I don't think, and, and so I don't take that for granted. Like I, I, I believe that, like we've tried stuff where like send an email in advance, giving people some instructions about how they should show up to something. I think some people would be like, fuck you. Like, what are you telling me how I'm supposed to act right. at a party or whatever? It's weird. But I think people have, at least in my evolving network, people are buying into that. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that's what, like, we want to prove that through some of that design, we can make those experiences valuable and then people will hunger for them and we'll continue to be able to evolve that. And I don't want to, I mean, I'm not taking credit. I should, you know, Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering was one of the things that really switched that on for me because I had it in mind, but I hadn't like really got into like tactics of that stuff yet. And then in reading her book, I was like, so many points where I was like, you know, yeah. uh, took notes and I'm like, I'm doing that tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm executing on that stuff. And so, um, so I think that ladders up to something much bigger, hopefully eventually. But right now I think that's like, we do have the macro of like, we're creating these spaces where we believe they are conducive to connection and openness. And we promote that idea um, in a big way. And now I think we're really getting into not just me, but other members of our team getting into that. Like, what are the practices that are truly connective? Uh Um, And how can we then start to, you know, systematize those things, um, make them scalable, allow other people to be able to facilitate once we learn the tools. Yeah. Um, And so, but then that's really exciting to me. Because when you think about our scale, it's like one thing to be like, wow, it's cool. We have so many locations. Then if you really believe that, those locations are amazing at connecting people. They're the best places in the world for that to happen. Then it goes to a whole nother place. Right. Well, let's go back to the beginning because the seeds of this communitarian sensibility go back to day one for you, right? Communitarian. Very, uh, is that a word? I don't know. I, don't I know. like it though. If you just made it up, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a good one. Communitarian. Communitarian, <laughs> community oriented. Yeah. Um, this runs in your blood. I mean, you had a very unorthodox uh, childhood growing up on this commune run by strong women. So tell me about this. Yeah, it's weird because commune is like the most simple word to describe the idea of communal living, but I think there's also some people associate commune with like cult and other stuff, ideological stuff that perhaps gets weird. Um, It was very purposeful, meaning the women in my family made the choice to live collectively, um, share responsibility for different parts of their lives that, you know, were both like, uh, replacing some of the things that normally happen in biological family, but then mm-hmm. also going to another level in terms of like, how do they get by, you know? So when they wanted to like live off the land at the time or be more disconnected from society, it's like, well, some people had to have jobs, you know, to yeah. like sometimes you need money for stuff, but it was very purposeful. And they had ideals about how um, we as kids would be raised. They were very comfortable, all of them with having kids um, without the father's being in the picture. And um, so there were five women who, and there were others peripheral, but there were five core women. These are like uh, friends of your mom? Like, yeah. how does this even come together? Yeah. Well, it's weird. I've actually, over the years, I keep asking, you know, just recently I've been like recording my mom telling the story. So uh-huh. I, I hope I'm telling them right. Um, and I don't want to steal their stories because I think they, they should be the ones who tell them. But um, my mom and like literally her like freshman roommate, you know, at Boulder um, became friends. And then they, you know, in the New Mexico, Colorado scene connected with other women. And I became this crew um, who were living together and in a very, again, like an idealistic notion, like they were actually, I mean, in the way they would describe it, they were like, the hippies were fighting back. They were like, we're done. We're out. You uh-huh. know, they were like that, you know, they were like extreme um, in the sense that they were like, we've lost connection to what's going on mm. in the world right now. We have to find something different. And so they really were trying to live completely outside of reliance on, on right. you know, and a lot of the words that we have now, like freegans and communitarians, you know, <laughs> yeah. they were, they were, um, they were that. And they, you know, so there's amazing stories of like them literally, um, getting their food from the dumpster in the back of a grocery store right? in an idealistic way, not because they were, I mean, they were poor, but they weren't poor meaning like they, like, they, like they were doing it for they were just for trying purposeful. to completely opt out of anything commerce yeah, oriented. Exactly. And yeah. then, so, and there's a bunch of influencing factors that affected their migration. But um, when they got to, from New Mexico to Eugene, where I grew up, they did have to re-enter society more formally because of us kids who are all in close in age. So, you know, um, similar band of, of ages, but we all 
they wanted us to go to school. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, we went to public school and they had jobs for a period of time. You know, my mom was like a latchkey teacher right. after school. I don't know what she got paid. You know, we had food stamps, you know. Was like, it stigmatizing for you, like to go to public school and have everybody else doing the traditional thing? Yeah, I mean, I did grow up in Eugene, I would say was a, was a, there was a hippie vibe there that was accepted. You know, like there were kids at school who had weird names. I mean, not Miguel is not a weird name if you're Hispanic, but Miguel is a weird name for like a white kid. And right. there were other kids named, you know, Wind and, right. you know, Morning Star and Evening Star yeah, yeah. and that summer, those kind of vibes. So it wasn't so weird, but, um, but definitely there were times like I didn't grow up with my father and, you know, there were times where I aspired to be normal. So mm -hmm. I would say, someone would say, oh, what does your mom do? And I'd be like, well, uh, mm, I don't know for sure exactly like <laughs> yeah, how you would define yeah. that. She's like, I mean, now I'd say, oh, she's a community activist. She's on, you know, public access TV. You know, she's doing all kinds of stuff that's cool now when I look back at it. But as a kid trying to define uh -huh. their parents' job, it was very weird. And then my father was in the picture. So I would say, oh, you know, my father is police officer on he's undercover you know you know mm -hmm. i made up stories to right. try to put him in a context that made me feel more um normal but at the same time i will say there was weirdness but we were also you know really like connected you know like we were a part right. of something like every weekend i was on a couch at someone's house who I didn't know, potluck, music, dancing, you know, people hanging out, um, felt creative, felt just good. And, and and I knew, so I knew I was a part of something bigger, whether I understood yeah. it or not, you know, and I was totally safe. Like I would like, you know, just fall asleep on the couch at probably age five or six at someone's house. I don't even know where I am, but I just felt totally comfortable there because I just knew I was a, we were, a, we were a community. We were like a connected group of people. Well, the word commune is such a loaded term that, you know, has a lot of baggage associated with it. But essentially what was happening, as far as I can tell, is really the way that humans evolved to live in tight-knit groups of people, not in you know, insulated family units, but as, you know, not and not as large as villages, but in, you know, groups probably the size of what you were raised in. And in many respects, that feels right. And I, and I know as a parent of four kids and we live way out in the country, like not having, you know, there is a sense of, of, of not feeling as connected um, as I have been, you know, to, to people in the past. And there's a yearning for that. Like, wouldn't it be great? Like, that's why we, I was telling you before the podcast, like we've gone through phases where there's like been like nine or 10 people living here. Like we've kind of run our own little, you know, loose knit version of that. Um, and it's nice. And well, yeah, when you come here, it's you, like, you can imagine if you had like five more of these little, little containers. Around, yeah. That's you know, the idea be, eventually, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and there's a comfort to that that feels very human and, and the way that it should be. You know, and I feel like, on, in, you know, our culture is just not rigged to promote that, but would we not be better off if there was more of that going on? Yeah. And, and, and so really, you know, my question is like, how do you think about, I mean, you've kind of already answered it a little bit, but like that experience of growing up in a communitarian, you know, environment, like how does that inform how you think about the communities that you're trying to create and cultivate and, and foster and grow in these spaces that, you know, you now create. I mean, there's, to me, it's like, you know, you can always see things 2020 in retrospect, but it's almost like it was perfectly designed to put you in this position to be able to um, recreate the best parts of what that childhood experience taught you in the workplace and now in the living space. Yeah, and it's, like you said, reflection makes things make sense, you know? And I think that at the time when I was a kid, I definitely had some rebellion to the communal hippie vibe, you know? Like I wanted to eat McDonald's and not, yeah. you know, co-op tempeh, you know? And so I had this like 
I did in some way rebel in the sense of business. And I also grew up in Eugene where Nike started. And I think that's a really important part of my history in terms of understanding, like, yeah, I was in this communal environment, but I also saw this energy that came from mm. what, something very commercial and sport and design focused. And so later on, that all adds up to, yeah. you know, a business that is based in community, but also is about brand. It's about, you know, some level of coolness and understanding how you need that um, ability to message something and brand something correctly in order to like get people to, yeah. to, to be a part or, of and it. And it has you know? an, and the aspirational ethos of it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a really important um, part to say like, there are things that are truly good in the world that are community focused. Uh, part of the reason that we've been able to scale and bring it to like a mass of people has been because we've also been really good at the business side. Right. Like, and that's what I think you don't think of as like, oh, the hippy dippy people mm-hmm. are like all about, you know, saunas and like, you know, <laughs> yoga. Yeah. That, that you, you, then it's like they don't make it, you know, and there are other brands that obviously have similar uh-huh. influences, but it's like, that's kind of the thing is like, how do you get that to be more of a mainstream thing? And I think that is where you said it was also good timing because a lot of that stuff has emerged more, you mm-hmm. know, uh, and, and it's not just us. I think there are a lot of other more mainstream places where this kind of stuff is part of the culture. I mean, your existence and podcast, obviously, as an example, it's like, you know, people are more interested in trying to get in touch with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you those sensibilities are important, but if you're allergic to spreadsheets, it's not going to work, right? Like, so how do you meld and merge the best of <laughs> yeah. both of those worlds to, like, alchemize all of that? To, to yeah, and create. that's part of, I mean, for me personally, like, that was the part that I felt, um, the community I took in a way for granted. Like, I knew I didn't like the office environment. Like, I was sure that was wrong. Uh-huh. You know, like I knew that that wasn't a good place for human beings on a day to day basis. That wasn't even a question. But I, but the response wasn't that like I wasn't, you know, I was actually against some of using the word community in the early days because I didn't want to claim something that we didn't actually have. And I and to me, a community is a really complex thing, you know, of a lot of different factors. Where does it you know, how does it really feel like a community? It's not like you just say you, you, you. Community. Yeah, you, you can't. Know. It's not something that you can control and yeah. manipulate. You can create. You can create an environment that's conducive to it, but then there's a letting go, right? For sure, and that was so. That was part of the thing. And Adam and I, um, you know, had some like er- early day arguments about that because he would be like, "Why, you know, why can't we call it a community, or why can't we use some of the imagery related to community in like the early marketing materials and stuff?" And I was like, "You know, we really have to." do it before we talk about it, mm-hmm. you know, and we have to pr- prove that it's possible before we start, you know, cause it, people would see that as fake. I think right. if you, if you try to, um, so we didn't talk a lot in the beginning. I mean, we talked to like the landlords and the people we needed from a business perspective, but we didn't like, we weren't that, we weren't telling that story that much in the early days. Mm-hmm. All right. So you're in this interesting living environment. You're six foot eight, right? Yeah, were I you like now. how tall were you when you were like fourteen and fifteen? I, well, I was like, always bigger. I'm like <laughs> scaled, always yeah. been bigger. You uh-huh. know? Like so, uh, you know, in all the school photos, like my head was above right. everyone else. Nike's know, down like the road. You're interested in sports. Uh, so what? You start playing basketball at, at school? Like how does you know how do you start yeah, becoming an athlete? It's interesting in that environment. My son, who now is nine and is a great basketball player, it's really interesting to compare because. His skill level, you know, I just played for fun when I was a kid. And I played uh-huh. every sport, baseball, football, basketball, um, not every sport. That's a narrow range of sports, but they're the like, you know, seasonal, natural things yeah. that you can be a part of as a kid. Um, and basketball, I didn't really become serious about until um, the summer before eighth grade. And to be honest, like I was a really overweight kid. I ate a lot of McDonald's, literally. Like I would say that as a joke, but McDonald's and Taco Bell were my uh-huh. main sources of. Your um, mom's like working hard to ban glyphosate. <laughs> You're sneaking off to the golden arches. Yeah, but that's you know that was a great thing about my mom is that she, as much as she was like 
so on top of all the right stuff to do. She also wasn't forcing it on me. She like uh-huh. made it an option, yeah. but she wasn't going to be like, you have to eat this disgusting stuff. Um, which to me at the time was gross. Like I was really like tofu is the worst, you uh-huh. know? Um, but she let me do it. You know, she took me through the drive through because that's what, what I wanted. And you know, who, who knows that all philosophical stuff we could, um, debate a lot. And now that I'm a parent, like, what should I do? I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, um, I obviously organic is best, but you know that for sure. But anyway, um, Sports definitely became like a part of my identity when I was in like high school and that, you know, being yeah. a basketball player like meant something. And um, and I do think that the learnings of like, you know, team and and really being willing to like um, both stand up and stand out, you know, and be like recognized, but then also be like totally part of a part, part of, of a, a, part of a like yeah. i mean i think i learned those lessons in a way that um that i think sports are one of the few places where you can right um but i wasn't like a superstar player or anything i was just like a good player um but you, know, you ended up like, playing at university of oregon right yeah yeah i did which i mean now looking back on it like again that's like an accomplishment which sounds cool and i'm really uh-huh. proud of my time there and you know i i really enjoyed it um but I also was a super good student in architecture school, uh-huh. and I love that, you know, just as much. So it was very balanced. Um, but you, didn't you go? Did you go to Colorado College first? Yeah. So I went to Colorado College for two years, and there's a great moment that I had, which I always got to shout out. This guy Carl, Carl Reed, who was a sculpture professor at Colorado College, and um, you know, I took his class. Colorado College. I don't know if you know the format there, but I, I want to yeah. promote it. It's, it's like one it's class at a time school. for a block for mm-hmm. a month, and so. You know, whatever you're taking, like total focus, like zeroed in on one subject right. matter. So, um, one of my favorite classes there was African American folklore, where you literally read like a book a day um, for a month, um, which was intense but amazing. But anyway, so I go into sculpture class and I'm making like whatever came to me. And this professor said, and I and I don't know what I'm doing at all. Like I'm like I like art; it's way better than economics or math or any other stuff. And it's also an escape, like art class for a month, you uh-huh. know, yeah. pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> no, you know. Yeah. So um, That's all you have to do. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's like go to studio uh-huh. and that's it. Make stuff, you know, all the time. And it was, it was great. And he says to me, he goes, you know, hey, your sculpture is really architectural. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, well, you know, if you look at it, it looks like you're sort of solving spatial problems and, you know, structural problems. And um, I was like, wow, that's cool. He goes, you should think about that for graduate school. Uh-huh. And by chance, and he didn't know where I, I was from at the time, he said, I, you know, University of Oregon is a great program. You should think about it. So that planted a seed where I was like, oh, whoa. Like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't have like a major. I don't know what my future holds. I was really actually unhappy at Colorado College, not for reasons that apply to the school, but more with the basketball team and stuff. And so that just clicked. I was like, yeah. oh, wow. And then I immediately from that moment forward, I like went to the library and like got an architecture book. You know, um, I got a, a Corbusier book. Um, I got a Frank Gehry book. Yeah. And Corbusier and Gehry are like so different, different in terms of their uh, approach to architecture. Um, but amazing in the impact that mm-hmm. they had on the profession and on – and so by luck, I mean, literally, I got those books by luck. And so I just completely was all in on that. And um, I, I spent the whole summer, that following summer, just literally like check out book, study it, memorize everything in the book, and then return and get another one. On your own. On my own, completely on my curriculum. own. And then yeah. you just, and then you transfer. Yeah. And so then I transferred, and I, but I had to apply still to the architecture school. So uh-huh. I had actually like a year out of, not out of school, but mostly out of school. Um, and that that was like tough thing for like for a high achieving person and you know someone who had um, not that I was like in love with school but I definitely was like good grades and all that so to have like a year out where I was kind of idle was tough but I think that I got really to know myself a lot better during that time mm-hmm. because um, because I had to be I wasn't in the format anymore you know right. like when you're in school it's like you just show up in the format and it's like yeah papers do or the projects do. If you show up in that construct and you you know you're successful, it's easy. But then once you're freed of that, it's like whoa, yeah. Like you have to make your own decisions about what time. So you kind of created your own curriculum to fill that time in the in between. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I was working at a restaurant, you know, bus boy. Right. Um, and just like, you know, trying to yeah, fill yeah. myself up to prepare because I wanted to be the best. Like, to be honest, like I was like, I want to be the best. Like, I want to be the best architecture Architect. student in who were history. Who were your guys? I mean, you started with Corbusier and Geary. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because Geary has always remained an inspiration to me, primarily because of his early days explorations where he was really going against, you know, a lot of things in terms of the diagram. And he would say that he still like uses the diagram and stuff, but a lot of stuff is just wild, you know? Yeah. And, and, and a lot of the professors that were at University of Oregon at the time didn't appreciate him, like didn't like him. They thought he was just arbitrary, making all these weird shapes for no reason. And so I like being kind of counterculture in that way. So for that reason, I appreciate him and I still do. The other is that when he did Bill Bao, uh-huh. the Guggenheim Museum there, I think he took architecture to a whole new place where the reason for that and the reason why Bill Bao invested in that project was because they wanted to define themselves as a culture. They were like this industrial yeah. place. You know, they weren't known as like having a good, you know, like whatever. The, they weren't a culture center, you know. And mm-hmm. so they said with architecture, we can reform, you know, and create this almost like culture heritage, I think, um, and define themselves as a region, you know, in that whole region, which has obviously great food. Um, but, but and, and, that, and that to me was like, whoa, this actually became a branding exercise. And this, again, sounds weird when you transfer it in the commercial, but it really is. It's like that building in Bilbao was a commercial draw. It was a tourist attraction. It was a redefinition of a place. It was a like, we completely... Yeah, you can't think about Bill. Different. You can't think about Bill Bow without thinking about that building. They're inextricably linked, right. and that that structure really defines, you know, how we, you know, think about urban landscapes and experiences them. I mean, that is it, it. It it is that is the brand of that city. Yeah. So to me, I was like, whoa, that's a whole mm-hmm. different thing than I had ever experienced before. And I have appreciation for other, you know, our, I mean, there's cool things about Frank Lloyd Wright. There's cool things about Louis Kahn. There's really cool things about modern, you know, some of the contemporary architects, Herzog and De Maron, you know, there's people doing amazing stuff. But I think a lot of a lot of the stuff in our world now stems from Bill Bao, like the whole mm-hmm. architect notion, the whole like meaning of buildings, I think, changed from that. And and so for me, the connection to that was I want to do something that goes beyond just the influence, just the goodness of good design, uh-huh. but actually something that moves culture forward in right. some bigger way. Yeah. Well, I'm a huge um, fan and somebody who appreciates great architecture and somebody who's experienced the impact of great architecture up close and personal. Like we live in an architectural home, We're very blessed to you know be in this space. Um, we were talking about it a little bit before the podcast. Um, and I can't imagine what my life would have been like living somewhere else because this structure has been like this crucible for everything creative that my wife and I have been able to accomplish. And it's the environment in which we raised our kids and the memories and just the daily experience of being in a structure that's oriented around like how we come together as a family unit and how we experience nature and how we engage with our creative selves. Like it's a very underestimated thing in our culture. We just think, oh, you build a building or you build a house. But when there's mindfulness and intention that goes into how a structure is created in the sense that it's oriented around promoting those, you know, a a certain set of values Um, it shapes how you live, every aspect of how you live. Yeah. Well, um, I get, I mean, I'm just so excited to hear you say that because Mm -hmm. what I get extremely frustrated by seeing things that are done for reasons other than that, Mm -hmm. you know, and there are buildings built for showing houses or for ego or, yeah. yeah. And I mean, there's so many, there's just uh, any number of stupid expressions of other things other than having like good motivations Uh for design. And there's, you know, and and there's dumb stuff that's just like, oh, 
there's a house with a great view of nature and they didn't even put a window in the right place. You know, so there's yeah. some of that stuff that's just like, how? Like you had this amazing <laughs> vista of like the ocean and, you know, or, you know, there's people who keep their curtains closed all the time to that view. And I'm like, how? But um, but then there's like the next level. Then there's like actually designing for intent, actually designing with purpose and trying to understand, you know, the flow of life. And there's this building that actually I've always loved, um, which you have something similar here. I'm curious how it affects you. But um, there's a Tadao Ando building, a very small house in, in Tokyo where he designed the living spaces in the front and the bedrooms in the back. And there's a, there's a courtyard and a bridge between the two. Mm -hmm. And his idea was, you know, waking up or going to bed, experience nature in between. And Mm -hmm. whether it's cold, whether it's rainy, whether it's hot, you're just going to know because every day you have to, you know, make that transition. And it's a very simple idea, but one that seems so beautiful and elegant to be like, you can't avoid it. Like you've got to, you know, connect to it. Um, and uh, and and I think that's that intention. I think is something that's missing in who knows what ninety yeah. percent of stuff that's built. Yeah, yeah. For our to go to our master bedroom, we, you have to go outside. Oh, you do. I wonder. Back outside. Yeah, back inside and outside. And how does that? Is it like? Well, how people often are is like, it? why would you design a house that? Like you, that must be a mistake. I'm like, no, that was very intentional. You know, and I love it. I think it's yeah. fantastic. And look, we don't live in Minnesota, so it's no <laughs> right. big deal. Right, right. Um, is there ever you know, a time where you're like, oh, it's pouring rain or something, and you're annoyed, or is it like, not that that would be bad? Well, but. I mean, this is you know, this house is at its best in the summer for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, when it's raining a lot, it's it can be a little bit of an annoyance, but it's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. You know. And yeah, we purposely set off the containers like at a distance from the house to, you know, make you engage with the outside a little bit and create a little separation. Right. And we have the communal, you know, the communal aspect of the house is, is separated from the private quarters and you have to go outside again to go in between both of those. And the whole idea is to bring nature into the experience. And it's a modern house, but it's not austere in the in the the sense of what people think of modernism in a traditional sense, because it has the rustic elements of the nature and those doors slide open and it brings that natural experience into the, into, you know, your experience of life. Yeah. I've only obviously been here for a short time, but when you first drive up, you have the immediate response of, Ooh, that's a modern house. And you uh-huh. can imagine that there's some crispness to that. it. Mm-hmm. But then when you come right in, it's like the materiality and there's a real warmth on the inside, yeah, which the feels idea. really nice. Like it feels immediately comfortable, yeah. which is, there are some houses designed like this that don't feel that way. Where you are yeah. like, Ooh, wait, am I allowed to touch anything? Yeah. Your house feels very much like, and the dogs help. You know? <laughs> the like, dogs help. You feel like, well, I have this, uh, right away, this, you know? this theory I don't know if I've ever said this out loud, but you know, it's really cool to have interesting people that inspire me like yourself come here to do the podcast. Like we've had so many cool people come here over the years. And even before I started the podcast, we would always have interesting people here. And I feel like every person that comes um, leaves like an energetic residue here that like enhances like the, like the spiritual vortex quality mm. of like our living space. I love that. I that's feel a good it. aspiration. I definitely feel I gotta, it. That's that's a new <laughs> yeah, like know. that's a new way of thinking yeah. about it, which I think is a um, that's cool. I mean, it helps that like you also have like the objects for some of the people. Like, there's history. If people get antsy, yeah. <laughs> they want to play with something. Yeah. Um, um, so cool. So all right, you're you're at Oregon. You're studying architecture. You're playing hoops. Were you guys good? You know, we were okay. We never made the NCAA. I was just there for two years. We didn't uh-huh. make the NCAA tournament. We made the NIT right. and lost in the first round. Uh-huh. But we got to go to Hawaii, you know, yeah. for the first round. So that that's was fun. Cool. Yeah. But we weren't awesome. I mean, Oregon since then, what, the other part that's funny They've about had it is years that where they were like Football and it. basketball. Yeah. Well, this year we're in the Sweet 16 in basketball. Yeah. Amazing accomplishment. Um, we've had 20 wins in a row in basketball for years since Coach Altman is there. He's awesome. But football has also had an incredible run um, that's been... And I think changed like changed the game. Actually, they sped uh-huh. up um, Chip Kelly, who came to Oregon. I don't know if you pay attention to college football. This dude came into Oregon and completely changed the game because of the speed at which they played. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it actually had to do with fitness and you know more attention to yeah. to wellness and overall um, presence and, and um, 
And and so I, I think he was great. Unfortunately, he left and then went to the NFL and has done other stuff. And But regardless, I think that that, um, that and the relationship with Nike where they made all these mm-hmm. super cool uniforms and equipment, that also changed right. um, sport. Um, what's another funny- br- Another branding exercise. I I- my first year at Oregon, we had champion uniforms. It was pre-Nike contract. That's crazy. Which is so weird because yeah. it's like, you know, Nike has been tied. But it just, you see, it's like business can either work or not. Uh-huh. You know, there wasn't a relationship at that time. And then my second year was the first year of like the Nike all sports contract um, concept. And so um, we got like some pretty basic Nike stuff, uh-huh. and then following years is just like, like all the coolest Nike year was all Oregon, yeah. you know, super <laughs> yeah, yeah. cool, you know, colors, and you could get any shoes you want and all that. So, I missed on that, but I'm planning to get back in on uh-huh. that somehow. Maybe this podcast will help. Do you, do, stay, do you stay connected to the basketball team? A little bit. I mean, not 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 specifically. I watch, but I have you know, it's tough time. Yeah. I would love to go to more games, yeah. but. Um, if they make it to the final four this year, then I yeah. want to go. Well, now watch. that your son's a player, yeah, he, that's a games. big part of it. He really starts to appreciate college basketball just uh-huh. now. He's a big NBA fan, but he's just starting to get. You go into to the it. Knicks. That's an exercise in self yeah, The abuse. Knicks are tough. He's become a fifty-fifty <laughs> yeah. Nets Knicks fan, so uh-huh. the, the Nets are great this year. Right, not great, but they're good. They're a great team to watch, and they're, and they're fun, um, and they're in a good direction. So we'll see about the Knicks. All right, so you then go to Japan. Right. So what was that about? Well, it's interesting because I intended to move to New York City. Like that was my dream. Uh You know, I wanted to move to New York. I'm not sure why for exactly, but I just knew that was the stage that I wanted to be on. That's where you birth a big life. Yeah, that was something. Like Mm -hmm. that was a place to get to. And um, I had the plan, saved up some money. But my friend is living in Tokyo. My One of my best childhood friends is living there. And I think, well, I graduated from school. I should at least go visit him in Tokyo. And and, and that would be a waste to not go there while he's there. So I, I go to visit him and I buy like a two-week train ticket um, to go travel around uh-huh. Japan and stuff. And I had studied Japanese architecture. So I had like I wanted to see the sites and all mm-hmm. that. I get there and literally within the first couple of days, we hatched the idea to start this website to like connect people to um connect people learning english as a second language to americans who could help them understand american culture uh-huh. because so, no one knew what scrubs meant <laughs> right that's the <laughs> famous know, thing it's, it's like, so funny like to launch a business based yeah. on like a term like scrubs but it was like no scrubs was the tlc song that was super popular uh-huh. and people would ask that like well, what's a scrub and it's like that takes a lot of nuance to be able to mm-hmm. explain what that is but we thought there was business in there it turned out to be effectively, you know, looking back on it, like a social network for people who are learning English as a second language. They didn't have that term back then, you know, community websites existed. But anyway, so we started that and it was very small, but it actually got some traction enough to give us the idea of like, wow, we can start a real company with this. And so we went on that journey of like starting a company and mm-hmm. raising some funding and being a startup, tech startup. And um, in Portland, we moved back from Japan to Portland and and it became a great little business. Um, it didn't like explode, you know. It didn't have the like right. huge growth that, but it became like a profitable business, and you know, one that actually my friend continued to operate for fourteen, fifteen years before so it you, sold. But you just had this pull to go to New York in the back of your mind, and every just year. had to like ripcord it out of there. Yeah, I mean, every year I was like, "Is this my last year?" And I think uh-huh. I was there for four years before I left, and. Um, and I and I was almost you know five years actually, and then I was almost thirty, and I was mm-hmm. like, I got a you know thirty was like the deadline. Yeah, and you haven't you haven't even started an architecture career yet. Yeah, and I also felt like I was to be honest, like I always said I'm never going to be that. First of all, I said I never be the guy, never be the guy who goes to University of Oregon because that's my hometown and that's uh-huh. lame, and I do that. And I'd be like, I'm never going to be one of those people who just like moves to Portland after school because that's uh-huh. lame too. And I was like that guy, a hundred percent. And but I, so I told myself I'm going to be out before I'm thirty, and mm-hmm. so I made it to New York the month before my thirtieth birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it's kind of a cool story too, because you were trying to get a job at these architecture firms while you were still in Portland. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny now to look back on it because now I feel like, oh, I'm accomplished in the world and stuff. But back then, I'm like, I was literally nobody, like to uh-huh. the extent of in the architecture world, like I was a really good zero student. Experience. But then I'm out five years and yeah. I'm literally nothing. Like my resume uh-huh. doesn't have anything applicable. So I'm like, I'm not even, you know, I'm not. So applying for jobs, it's like, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm like, a business leader sort of in Portland. Like people uh-huh. know me a little bit. I've been in the newspaper, you know, and then I like trying to get a job at an architecture firm and it's like the lowest of the low right. I can't even get, you know? Uh-huh. Um, so finally, luckily this little firm, you know, Jordan Parnas who hired me, like hired me $10 an hour and like, I'll take a chance on you. I think because he just needed someone who would be like a drafts person. Yeah, and I think part of that also, you know, to be honest, there's in the architecture profession, especially at the time, there are a lot of amazingly talented designers who mm-hmm. go to school in the U.S. and they come out and the English skills are not good, but they want to work at firms and they're incredibly talented, way more talented than I've ever been, but they're missing, they, they're they not great communicators yet. And so for me, yeah. coming in and being able to do the role at a very low level, but actually being able to like communicate really effectively as a like as I was as a business leader gave me a different kind of position and so when it came to the um, American Apparel projects which we were focused on I had a different presence there than people who were just Mm -hmm. great designers I just showed up differently right because you were able to communicate with these guys at a higher level than just some young kid right out of school Yeah. And also someone who like had the appreciation for design, but also knew business, Uh you know, and knew. So American Apparel, when I got there, was in the earliest stages of their retail development. So and, you know, there was some cool whatever you call it, culture behind them. Um, Yeah. I mean, people forget like at that moment, it was a big deal. Like they were those billboards were, you know, insanely provocative. There was just tons of, you know, news about it. You know, Ryan talks about it all the time. And then you have Dove, who's just like this insane character that you probably had to deal with well, from time to time. Uh, yeah, but even more than that, they also were uh, trying to do they were bringing manufacturing yeah, back to the United, United States. States. They were made, trying to pay people LA. a good wage. Mm-hmm. They were like giving English classes and massages on the job. You know, they were trying to compensate people fairly. So there was a good like foundation to that mm-hmm. from a sort of ethical perspective. It's you know, it's weird that Dove had those two sides of being like really caring, but then also being so outlandish in a way. Right. Um but yeah, it felt good. Like it felt like a good thing to be a part of at the time. So you're at this tiny two, two or three architect firm, and then this contract just lands in the lap of you guys to build the first American apparel store. And that blossoms into essentially building like a lot of them, right? Yeah. All of them? Like, Not all. So it was a little bit split because they had the West Coast team uh-huh. and we did a lot of the um, East plus international. So we were um, a part of a growth path that went from early handful of stores to at some points, you know, maybe 40 to 50 concurrent projects happening yeah. around the I mean, that the escalation US. was really fast. Yeah. I mean, one of the fastest so retail to, rollouts. It had to be a pressure cooker. It, You know, it's interesting. Like, Dov is such a cool character because of the things that he cared about you know he really cared about lighting for example like he really Uh cared about about lights and the color of lights and stuff so it was just like you know some some things he cared about with schedule and time and stuff but there are some moments i have with him where he's like what the fuck are these lights get these all out of here and literally it's like everyone hand all hands on deck you have to like go unscrew every light bulb and change it to a different (laughs) bulb like on demand just because there were things you know that he really like he was in the details, mm-hmm. you know, of some things like that. And um, and I like appreciated that. Like there were times when I really thought he was an asshole, to be honest. Um, but I also really thought he was doing something good. And yeah. I think that was okay to me. Like I felt like it was like an okay trade-off, at yeah. least in my experience. The other people I can't speak for and who experience probably other things. Mm-hmm. But for me, being yelled at, screamed at, get this done, you know, move faster, do it cheaper. Like I took that as like, I'm going to learn from this every moment rather than be like, oh, this guy's an asshole. It sucks. I'm going to be like, this is a great opportunity to learn from uh-huh. this, to be under this pressure. Yeah. And if you can get through that, then you're weatherproofed for basically yeah. anything. I would say two experiences in my life. One working with Dove. The other, I worked in Alaska in a fish processing plant for 16 hours a day. I was like, those two experiences, it doesn't really get, like you've kind of had it all. Like the monotony uh-huh. of endless salmon 
coming off the off the the conveyor belt and the like super intensity of someone screaming at you to like mm-hmm. do something that's totally unreasonable outlandish i kind of like have always drawn on those things as like i can handle anything yeah and i would have to think that being around dove like there's a there's a he's a complicated figure but there's an audacity to his vision like he he was shooting for the stars right like the 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 scope of what he was trying to do was gigantic and yeah. in certain respects he was successful in accomplishing that at least in the short term so did that end up informing like the big vision that you held for for we work i don't think consciously but i think it definitely was inside of me in terms of the way that i internalized like business and vision and like you know and really what was possible through force of will because uh-huh. I'm not that kind of person. Like, I'm not right. a person who would, like, scream or yell or, like, you know, fight for something. Like, it's just not in me. I'm a much more reserved person. And so I think it informed my relationship with Adam in an important way um, because I learned things about myself. Like, I was able to exist with Dove. Not that I had that much interaction with him, but I could, like— pick up the phone and hear him yell at me Mm -hmm. and be okay. Not personalize it. Right. Just, I was resilient in that. Like, okay, fine. I got yelled at. I'm not going to go into a hole or into a shell. I'm going to just keep on moving forward, you know, no matter what. And I think that that's like an important um, thing to realize what my capabilities were in that construct. But I also knew I wasn't him. I wasn't like the person who could drive people like that. I couldn't be, I was really laid back, you know, like I'm like an Oregon Dude, right? You know, like you're a chill, chill dude with the design chops and the attention to detail, but then Adam has like this charisma and this like relentless persistence, right? That makes for a great combination. Yeah, and a kind of drive that was way different than mine in terms of like just nonstop energy. You know, that like uh-huh. willing to just like every day be at like max. You know, right. and that's something that I give him so much credit for because um, he's still that way. Like mm-hmm. he's still, you know, literally can just, he, you know, he's nonstop. Like in some cases it's like you need him at a seven rather than a 10 because he <laughs> can relate better to like uh-huh. normal people uh-huh. at a seven, you know, and he knows that he's developed his own self-awareness. In that. Yeah. <laughs> in the early days, it might be like all 10 all the time. Yeah. Some people are like, whoa, like that's Yeah, but that's much. how you ended up with those early leases. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's what, I mean, again, going back to like, how do you, how are we successful early on? Amazing formula of Adam being able to push and convince and really through force of personality, get people to do stuff that they didn't want to do. And then me to be able to back that up like immediately, like really to be able Mm -hmm. to turn that around and like make something credible really fast so that it seems like we're nobody to someone and then literally we're someone, you know, the next right. day. He can spin the yarn and then you have to fulfill on the promise. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's and, that, and that's another thing uh-huh. that which I had no, I ne- I've never told him to like slow down. I've never told him not to make a promise or anything. Uh-huh. Like I've never said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? I might have been thinking in my head, like, dude, why are you You're saying way that? way ahead of yourself like, here. <laughs> why are yeah. you promising that we'll do that? <laughs> yeah. But I didn't, but I don't say that because uh-huh. I knew, at, at least especially in those early days, and now it's obviously a, way larger team, but in the early days, it was my job to back that up. Yeah. You know, and obviously he's a part of that as well, but I'm just saying the the formula is like, he's going to push us and I'm going to figure out how to fulfill, you know, Uh that, that space that he would create. And, um, and it was, I think it's a, it was a really powerful, um, formula. Like it really was, however it happened, it was, um, special. Well, I want to get to how it happened. So you're, you're building all these stores, these retail outlets for American Apparel, like why not just ride that out and stay there and be this successful architect? Yeah. I mean, there's something there in terms of like, you know, how many times can you do the same thing? Uh And certainly with American Apparel, we did a lot of the same thing. And for me, I mean, I really look for the challenge, the opportunity to, to grow. And again, I probably wouldn't have used those words then, but it's the choices I made reflect the fact that I'm like always looking for the next way to when the growth curve starts to plateau yeah you start looking around and i get bored super fast like i get some as soon as i figure something i love teaching myself stuff but once i learned it i'm like okay like Mm. 
that that was cool, but now I need something else. And um, so I think with American Apparel, I just hit the end. I was like, I can't do another one, you know. And it wasn't changing really; like it was just the same. Right. It, the, the the foreseeable future looked the same. And so I did a few kind of projects that were outside of American Apparel, and um, and at that point, I just needed a, a different scene. And so, um, but but at the time. Where we were was a cool community. That firm was in a building in Brooklyn and Dumbo that was like made up of mm-hmm. like cool small companies and like, you know, it the vibe was great. Like in terms that of that neighborhood like, is amazing. There's yeah, so much and, cool stuff happening there. And it's really gotten like even better. You yeah. know, I mean, you can complain about whatever real estate prices, that's always the you know, places like cool when it's rough and then it uh-huh. gets better and then it gets expensive and all that. But um, but it's a cool energy there. And um so I convinced Adam to move into that same building. Um, and How did you meet Adam? So Gil was my friend at work who's an Israeli yeah. guy and all, very similar to me, like very chill dude, uh-huh. you know. And um, so we became friends and we're sitting next to each other at the office. And, you know, I don't, ha- I don't know that many people. I'm still relatively new to New York. And he says, hey, what are you doing this weekend? I'm like, I don't know. They come over to our apartment. We're like hanging out. Uh-huh. And so I like walk into this building, you know, it's on Broadway and like Worst Street in Manhattan. And I mean, remember it clearly because like we came on and like, I forget what floor, maybe we're on the elevator, go up a floor or two and doors open and Adam comes on and Adam is like, you know, I'm a tall dude. I'm six foot eight. He's six foot four or whatever, uh-huh. six, five something. And he's no shirt on, shorts, no shoes. And like just beaming energy just like you know like he's like a buzz and then he's like actually literally buzzing and just talking nonstop. and i don't even know i can't remember uh-huh. a word he's saying but i just know he's talking to everyone on the elevator and i you know a new york elevator is usually not filled yeah. with conversation yeah you know especially <laughs> yeah. amongst people who don't yeah. know each other uh-huh. and this is his apartment building so he knows people who live there and he's he and his sister i think have like tried to build community mm-hmm. like they've actually been living in the building for a while so they tried to like get people to know each other and they talk to everyone and everything but i don't know this you know i don't know the history of their right. existence so to me i'm like what the fuck is going on this is so weird and so um the the key moment of like my like whoa was um that we're all on the elevator and i don't know there's four or five of us and he's talking to someone and that person walks off the elevator and he holds the door and just continues the conversation as they're like walking yeah. down the hall. Yeah. And I remember just standing there going like where well, there's other people in the elevator. Yeah, like, yes. this like is the so... audi- like the the self-confidence and the poise that that requires. Yeah, like yeah. just not like I've never like it seems so small, uh-huh. but yet it's so big from a it human perspective to be like yeah. like that is an audacious thing to do cuz it's just not done. You know, it's like the kind of thing it's like, you're breaking all social norms in that situation. You know what I mean? And that, I certainly don't do that kind of stuff. I'm like way more like, Oh, I'm quiet. I'm I like yeah. care about everyone. I'm like, you know, I have like the Japanese like ideals of keeping everything calm and, uh-huh. you know, um, so I remember that clearly because that whole day turned into an experience of like us hanging out and, you know, um, feeling a lot of trepidation and discomfort, but then knowing that I needed that or that I was interested in it. And that was really the thing. I mean, I think if you go to like, what was I searching for in New York? I wanted things that were foreign to me, things that made me feel uncomfortable, things that were hard. Um, I wasn't looking for an easy life. I was looking for the things that would like be, you know, not Portland, not Eugene. Right. And so where does was, that, where does, not to interrupt you, but like, where do you, where does that, what's the genesis of that? Like, wh- where does that come from? That like drive that energy? You know, it's a good question. I, I've always had a feeling that, um, that I could be a part of something different. And I, I know that just sounds weird, but it's like I've always foreseen myself doing things in a way that everyone else around me wasn't doing them. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you look at going back to, like, architecture school, for example, it doesn't sound crazy now to say that I love Frank Geary. But in my entire class, as well as almost the whole school at the time, there was, like, one other kid who even, like, really knew who he was, you know? And that was, like, my, like, all-in you know, love of the, of architecture was based on that. So, you know, when I did my first projects, my first design looked nothing like all the other Uh um, kids. And I was willing to 
stand in front of that and present it um, comfortably for some reason. Like that was just, I knew that was me. Like I knew I just wouldn't be the same as everyone else. And I don't know, what's weird about that is it goes counter to my actual physical presence, which has always been, again, being bigger than normal. And especially as a kid when I was fat, I was always trying to recede. I was always trying to be like in the background. Like I always wanted no one to notice me. And I spent a lot of time at other people's houses because, you know, um, I didn't have boys as friends. And so I was at my friends' houses a lot, my male friends. And, um, you know, I would get (laughs) criticized for like eating too much. Uh And I'm like a big fat kid. Of course, you know, why are you having three slices of pizza? You know, like that kind of stuff happened to me. So I think that I often tried to like disappear in those scenarios. Um, And yet for some reason, when I got to this other place, I just developed this comfort with always being the like outlier, like always just trying to do something different. And I'm not sure. I don't know why exactly. Mm -hmm. I just, it just switched at some time. And I think that um, it came, I don't know. And it came from just an unwillingness to like, you know, as soon as people got jobs, and bought houses and cars and TVs. And I was just like, that, whoa. Like, yeah. I'll never be that that guy. Like, yeah. I'll never, I mean, I obviously now um, have some of those things. But, like, you know, I just, I don't know. Right. Just and then didn't you, do it so, the same way. I right. couldn't follow the same path. Yeah. It just, I just couldn't. Right. And then you collide with this shirtless dynamo. And you're like, this guy's my my ticket to, you know, Continue you know, I, my path to being this iconoclast. Again, I don't know if it was like, I think, I don't know when, you know, that realization happened. Obviously, uh, like that day I was just like, whew, something's going on there that's yeah. different. And over time, I think the the bond that we built was um, when he moved into the building and then we were both there. And we we're both very hard workers in the sense that we're like putting in the extra uh-huh. hours and stuff is that we spent a lot of time just like walking around the neighborhood, you know, and just talking about stuff and trying to like feel each other out, I think, you know, and, um, and realizing that we had like real differences, but somehow we both developed an appreciation for each other. And I, you know, it's hard to say why, like, I don't know why there was in some way, like some kind of attraction Mm -hmm. or, you know, magnetism that happened there. But what do you think that he saw in you? You know, I don't know for sure, but what I would think is that he hasn't, he didn't have up to that point a lot of stability in yeah. his life. He had a lot of people in his life that were very, you know, like family and other conditions that, you know, weren't consistent, that weren't calm. Uh-huh. You know, if he was on this right cycle you could, of, you could ground him yeah i probably had some kind of consistent energy you know mm-hmm. and i think when he would search me out sometimes you know maybe that's why i mean maybe it's like he wanted to connect to some of that some of that more right um consistency and i hope that you know i hope that um that that was like I, I mean, again, we we don't we haven't talked about it that much, but I do hope that that was like yeah. was what I felt it was, you know, which yeah, was a good. I, mean, I, I would imagine you're 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 seeing in each other things that you don't have, or that you aspire to have, or that you need in your life, right? So this is like perfectly complementary yin yin and yang thing. Yeah, and it didn't really have purpose at all. That's the other thing yeah. too. Is it wasn't like it started out with like, hey, we're going to do business together. It wasn't like that. Right. It was just something else. It was like, you know whether it was friendship or whether it was just we're both sharing an energy with each other that we needed. Um, uh-huh. Not clear, you know, it wasn't like there was a specific reason for us being together and spending that time together, but it, but it was something um, that we both just, it, we had, we needed. Uh-huh. So he, he moves into your office building and he's doing his entrepreneurial thing with like baby clothes or something right. like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So when does the idea like, Hey, let's do something together kind of enter the picture? Well, so we started talking about some different projects that were like, you know, at the time of the like residential explosion mm-hmm. around the world, but also in Manhattan, there was a ton of people. It's kind of like the dot com era where it's like, well, everybody's right. developing real estate, you know? 
Um, and so we looked at some like residential projects and we had that in mind, like, Hey, we could do something, this spot, that spot. Um, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't formal. It wasn't like we had really had a partnership or anything. It was just like these different projects seemed interesting. And, uh-huh. and, uh, what really, I mean, he had done in his, um, in school, when he was in school, he did a project that was, um, related to like community housing and like this idea that you could, um, create something more, Connective, and he had been exposed to this uh, co-working model that someone else was doing in New York. I hadn't really ever seen co-working before. Like I saw the environments in Brooklyn where yeah. there was a lot of these small companies working together, but I didn't know formally what this was. Um, and so he said to me one day, like, hey, uh, we could do a co-working space. Like he looked at the economics of this building, and they were charging a very low rent and basically no services, you know, just uh-huh. like – in Dumbo. Yeah, in Dumbo. Here's the landlord of the building we're in. It's like, hey, here's this space. You can have it. Take it or leave it, you know? Not very good marketing or sales. Um, not good customer service. So um, he had the idea of like, hey, we can make this kind of like this serviced office model that he had seen before. And um, so I went and and he was trying to convince the landlord that we could do this. But the landlord is like, you have a baby clothing company. I don't yeah. even know who this other guy is. Um, so, but they just didn't care. They're like doing fine. They have like a uh-huh. good business. They're renting out space. So it's like, it's not, they were, their space was in demand, even though they're charging a low price for it. They didn't need us for anything. Yeah. So Adam really did a good job of like continually going back. And at the same time, I was hatching some ideas of of what could it be if we actually did this? Like if we did a like shared office. And so I went and saw um, c- a couple of the things that were, called that at the time and they were horrible in my mm. uh my design view mm-hmm. i'm like these places suck at the time where they just open floor plans with long tables no actually and- the opposite the places that the big mistake and i and i forget the name i'm it's escaping me now but there, there was a, a company that was emerging in new york who was doing something um that was like co-working and shared office and to me they made a really uh fatal mistake which is that they put a lot of their money into their newest, coolest location, and it was a long, skinny building with windows only on the ends. Uh-huh. And then they built these custom partitions, which were kind of like modern cubicle, and they were all black. Mm-hmm. And they were solid. Mm-hmm. And so you come into this place. It's all dark. They actually had like club. They were in the club scene, so they had like club music playing. Uh-huh. It was super dark, and they had black partitions that absorb all the light, and the windows are only you know far. And I went into that place, and I was like, I wouldn't spend five minutes in here, yeah. let alone what I was looking for, which was like, this is should be amazing. Like, you should feel so good when you walk into this place. Like, that was the whole point. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, we can do something way, way, way better than this. And, um, and so that started to come into my head of like, what are we, what would we do if we got the chance? And by, you know, coincidence, Adam finally, you know, gets the landlord to like, say, okay, here's a building, what would you do with it? And that was like the hinge point because I think when we finally got the opportunity, we uh-huh. and we hadn't really formalized anything, but we got the chance to turn that into, you know, a really quick business model, brand, which was not we worked. That was Green Desk before. Right. But Green Desk was oriented towards environmental responsibility and and turning that around really quickly, I think, gave us that initial credibility. Like, mm-hmm. okay, you were nobody today yesterday and now you're somebody. Right, so Adam pers- you know, just pesters this guy enough until he finally relents. And then you guys are suddenly in the position of like, all right, I guess we're gonna do this, right? And like bootstrapping this thing literally overnight to yeah. try to make it happen. I mean, how did you even have, was it a whole building? Well, it started as just one floor. So uh-huh. the beautiful little building in Dumbo that I mean, they how had- how did you even they, finance that? Well, so luckily, and this is part of the, you know, again, the. The being in the right place at the right time was that these owners of the property, um, they had this building it was super cool, uh-huh. beautiful windows, you know, timber, brick and timber, you know, kind of the ideal like um, uh, it was old like coffee Ruby, warehouse, you Brooklyn know, Brooklyn loft, yeah, that. exactly. And um, they say, you know, what would you do with it? Well, we come back with like the design ideas, looks really cool. Who's going to pay for it? And we made, you know, we made a partnership with them and they paid for it and we designed it, built it, run it. They paid uh-huh. for the build out. So 
it became 50 50 from that. So, um, in, a, in partnership with the owners of the building. Yeah. Right. And so, then from there, we were very successful. I mean, literally, like we put tape down on the floor showing these are the spaces, and we uh-huh. had renderings of what it's going to look yeah. like, and we started selling it. and People loved it right off the bat. And so we knew we were onto something from the first floor, built it out, filled up, another floor, another floor, another floor. And I mean, we were doing much better. I mean, so even their return on, you know, their 50% was way more than they're getting on their normal rent. So Mm -hmm. they could see this is something cool. They Uh like it. They'll continue to build it out as we went. So we did that whole building and then we started doing floors in that other original building that we had been in. And so it was clear that it was something. But the real hinge point in terms of Adam and I was that we won, I forget if the building was full. Maybe we had mostly filled it up, but we were like, we're going to have like a party for the first time. Uh-huh. And um, we bring everyone together. And like, I literally think like we looked on the internet for like networking techniques or whatever. And there was this like speed networking thing uh-huh. where it's like, you know, you make two lines and then you each, you talk to each person for like 30 <laughs> seconds and then you shift. Uh-huh. And it sounds like so cheesy and we didn't know what we were doing, but like mm-hmm. that spawned a lot of people then more organically and casually interacting Mm -hmm. that evening. And then the next day, literally just that elevator ride felt different. And then the the whole workspace felt different because before everyone was kind of in their own office, even though it was glass, they had familiarity, but they weren't really connecting on, on the level that we um, noticed they were after that night. Right. And that really like shifted something where we 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 then felt like, whoa, this is what it's all about. Like seeing the people who need each other so much in this context, like small business people, entrepreneurs, you know, freelancers, people who are trying to start something new, what they really need is that like connection. They need the opportunity to like have someone else who's in the same boat because mm-hmm. your family doesn't, you know, you've experienced it. Like when you're working hard, sometimes you gotta get away from your family you know you got to get out and so you leave your apartment you're on your own you're working really hard no one gets it why are you doing this why did you quit your job you know all these other stories that come with that adventure and what you really need is a community of people that are supportive in that construct and so that was from that moment we're like okay green desk was wrong it's something new we got to sort of start over right so well a couple things in that i mean first uh just the idea that you had to okay, we're going to have a party and we're going to try to get these people together speaks to, you know, that, you know, core value of community that that existed at the inception. So I presume Adam shared that, you know, that vision and that value. I mean, did he, you know, he grew up in a commune, but he's Israeli, right? Like, did he live in a kibbutz? Yeah, or yeah. Did he have I mean, like he a spent- similar kind of experience that gave him that same, um, yeah, so interest. I mean, he had experience as in a kibbutz, but I also think he had the like being a part of a community in New York as well. Uh-huh. You know, um, of just like you got to depend on people. You know, you get somewhere new, yeah, you're out in a new city. Who are you going to rely on? Finding people that like you can actually um, count on and building a, a group of people that you know you can spend time with. And he's a great. He loves, like, hospitality. He loves bringing people together. He loves being a host. I mean, it's something that he takes great pride in. And and um, he actually, you know, when he does it privately, he works super hard at, like, bringing people together mm-hmm. and making it a great experience. And um, so he has that motivation of really, like, he he wants those experiences to be deeper. You know, he doesn't want you to just, like— you don't show up at the party because it's just the cool place to be. You show up because you're actually getting something yeah. from it. And um, he cares about that. And he he, uh, he did from the start. And so mm-hmm. it was like that combination of like, I wanted to make the space where this is like persistent. Like we're going to make the design these spaces where that connection is possible any moment. And he was much more of like the peak moments. Like that's yeah. what he, he would be like, when we do a party, it's going to be the best party. You know, or we bring right. people together. It's going to be like the best thing they've ever been to. Right. And he, you know, so when we've, um, as we've evolved, then we've gotten Mm -hmm. into like our summer camp events and, you know, our summit events and stuff like that. Like a lot of that motivation is for him of really wanting to bring people together and then to make it awesome, you know, make it amazing. So you have this inflection point because this um, real estate partner that you have, they have, your, your, your interests begin to diverge because they basically just want you to focus on their buildings, right? Um, 
And you could have said, okay, filled their buildings and had like a really nice business. Yeah. And just said, you know, and maybe kind of inch your way out of that to other buildings once you had filled those to capacity. Um, but instead, you take, you, you, you know, you do this risky move where you're, you break up with this partner. Um, and that all goes back to this like bigger vision that you held. Yeah, there was a couple of moments in there where I remember when we finished the first building and like if we would have just stopped there. It would have been good. We would have been like the most money I would have ever had <laughs> yeah, in my yeah. life, you know, like just in the monthly uh-huh. income. Like I was like, we, we were all like, wow, this is actually pretty good. Um, and then when we sold, we also had a moment like that where we were like, you know, we had a chunk of money that we could have been right. like, wow, you put that in the bank. And our, and our third partner, yeah, third partner uh, who Gil, did that, right? who, who did that, who, yeah. you know, um, went back to Israel and, um, you know, said this was a achievement and, and, um, but Adam and I just immediately, I mean, Adam even said to me, he was like, don't put that money in my bank account just keep it, you know, or put it somewhere else. Cause I know, you know, I'll spend it, uh-huh. if, it if I have access to it. But he, he was like, we're letting it ride for sure. Um, so from, it was never even a question. Yeah. Not a question that it was, we're just, you know, at the beginning of this and we, we put all that money that we got um, into the start of the next thing. Mm-hmm. And I think from the very beginning, that was because we knew it was big. Like it wasn't like, yeah. oh, we're gonna do another version of Green Desk where we could like be comfortable and like or we make money. That that never came into it. It wasn't like, oh, we hit on a good business model. Like let's make you know what I mean? Like we knew at that moment that this is like okay, this can something way, way bigger. Mm-hmm. It's not gonna be about like our individual financial success. This is a part of a way, 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 way bigger thing. Right, but then you have the practicality of like trying to get the, you know, what's gonna be the first new building and what has now been rebranded as WeWork, right? Like you're still two young guys, you got a little bit of money, but yeah. these are, I mean, this is, you know, this is capital intensive. And it's also know, the New York real estate world. Yeah, it's you insane, know, where it's right? Like, where, where no one, you know, like family and credit and all these things matter, you know, lot, relationships, right? which we knew nobody. But you did have one thing that happened, which is in 2008, like the market turned, right? right. So suddenly there's there's vacancy where there didn't used to be and there's not as much demand. Yeah, so two things, I mean, there's that part, which is there's vacancy, there's less demand, there's less like new tenants coming around uh-huh. the corner. So a landlord who wants to wait that out doesn't have a clear path for one. But then, too, there was some difference, at least in the argument of what, like, a credit tenant is, right? Because you you were thinking that, like, Lehman mm-hmm. Brothers is, like, a credit tenant at the time, you know, right? Like, you think that's not a company that's going down. <laughs> yeah. That's a rock-solid, uh-huh. you know. And then a lot of the companies like that, mm. maybe not at Lehman Brothers level, but at lower levels were affected. They defaulted on leases. So we could at least say, hey, that was the old way. Like, we're the new way, Um and and I don't think anyone believed it, but at least it was like gave them a little bit of comfort, you know, uh-huh. in like in our story. Uh, and um, we 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 had a lot of buildings that we put a lot of time into that then didn't work out because yeah. when the boss heard about it, it was like no way. Like the whoever the real estate management team was like, yeah, these guys are cool, they're doing something interesting. And then the boss heard about it, and he was like, no, that's a stupid idea. Uh-huh. You know, we never rent to those kind of people. You know, was there ever a moment where you thought maybe this isn't going to work, or was Adam just so persistent? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't my, I mean, my brain doesn't really work that way. Uh-huh. I don't usually. How does have, it work? Well, I think it's more like always moving forward with some level of, I don't know, like confidence that if we're doing something that's good, it's going to work out. You know. And so I don't remember ever having any question about that. But I also don't think we had much downtime to worry about. It was like even though uh-huh. the deals weren't coming through, the, you know, Adam was like creating the deal flow mm-hmm. where it was always the next one and the next one and the next one. And it's like we're producing for each one of those. We're negotiating the lease. We're producing some you know, sketch version of what the building's going to look out, look like, how much our income could be. So we're kind of test fitting all those uh-huh. projects before we um, – so it wasn't like we're just sitting around going like, What's going to happen? Yeah. We're pretty much in it, waiting for like the domino to fall, you know. And then, what was the break that led to the first building? Well, 
<laughs> that's a it, it's weird because you know this is business but there was a lot of um emotion that went into it um back then and the first building uh w- was a building owner who i i have love and something opposite for um because he did take a chance on us but he also um I would say tortured us to some extent by just fighting every single term of the lease. Um, you know, who just being so intense as a negotiator and a arguer and a person who like felt like every term was life and death for uh-huh. him. And this is the way some of the people, I mean, this is a, a man who, you know, his family escaped Syria, went through like serious stuff. Like he thinks of that building as just part life. of his life and his mm-hmm. family's future. So I don't begrudge him that, but at the same time, like the fight for every millimeter of that deal was in hours and hours and hours of, of arguing. And, and for me, that's not, I don't enjoy that. Like maybe right. some people love that negotiation. But now looking fight. back, thinking like that was one of the more difficult leases that you ever had to negotiate, does it feel all the sweeter? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, yeah. it doesn't because it was uh, it, w- it was really hard for me. Like uh, it was hard emotionally. And then, you know, and there were other layers of, of difficulty once we started building out that building because if you look at like just the lease, then imagine now we're trying to build and it's like there's issue after right. issue in the building and now you have to argue about who pays for this unexpected uh-huh. cost. I mean, there was so much time and energy arguing and fighting that it took a lot out of me, which I wish I could look back on it fondly. But to be honest, like I, I, I but you wanted that learning curve, <laughs> right? I know. Did it, it's did it make you bulletproof for yeah. the next go around? Yeah, you know? I, I, it, I, I, it, I, you know, it, it did, but it, in some ways, but it also, there is that building when I walk by it and I love that it's the foundation of the company, but I honestly, like, I, it, I feel something right. that feels painful. Uh huh. Is it the one, is it in Soho? Yeah, it's yeah. Lafayette mm-hmm. and Grand. And I love it. It's like where we started. It's an amazing building. It's great yeah. for the members there, but to be honest, it's hard for me to like walk through it. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but I should add also, and this is an important part of the equation, is that my son, who is the exact same age that we work, was also was born at the same time right. that this was happening. So I was in the most intense phase of both of those things. And so that was, you know, I didn't sleep for a long time. And I was, you know, so it, it um, I think it was a lot of things that added up. And again, I'm not, I'm, I mean, we made it through it. It's great. But it was hard. It was super, super, uh-huh. super hard from an emotional perspective. And, I mean, add to that, it's a startup where we didn't have – we spent the money to build the building. Every month we were on the hook right. for the rent. You know, And I believe that if we defaulted, that was someone who would, like, take the building back. Yeah, it wasn't someone who's like, oh, no problem. Pay me next mm-hmm. month. You know, So I watched the bank account every day and, like, was always, like, like – making sure like I got to, when we get to that month, make sure that we've done mm-hmm. all the stuff right with the money. So we have, you know, that we pay on time, right amount. You Was know. it a similar experience with, that you had with, with Green Desk though, where you, you know, were able to fill subscriptions like right oh, yeah. away and you just knew, you knew For like sure. this is, this concept works. And that was the balance. Like yeah. we were, it was so great in the building from the beginning. And uh-huh. we had this, we had an amazing community team from the start, um, Lisa and Nathan, who were the first community management team. And they were incredible at bringing people together. And also the members that we had from the early days were awesome. So you, it was both sides. That's what was so interesting about it was uh-huh. that there was so much fulfillment in this, like what you got from the energy of being in the building and then this other side of like, wow, it's hard to make this work um, every yeah. day. And, but I mean, it was all worth it for sure. Right. As a, de- as a designer, as an architect, when you're f- faced with the proposition of a build out, you're looking at a floor plan and it's up to you to figure out how do I create a roadmap, a design, a structure, a flow 
that is conducive to promoting these values that I care about? Like, how do you think about that and then break that down and kind of implement that into a physical space? Well, first of all, it's definitely been an evolution, a long evolution that we're still, you know, learning from and trying to figure out. But there were a couple of things that I actually, they seem so basic, but like the first thing I felt like was that you want people who feel happy because if we run into each other Mm -hmm. at the coffee machine or whatever, if we're happy, we're going to have a good interaction. If one of us is like feeling like shit that day, either we're not going to speak or I'm going to like drag you down or vice versa. Right. So, so there was this fundamental thing of how do you get a feeling of like, wow, this space feels good. And for me in architecture school, it was like daylight was always a big part of that. So first thing we had was every building will be on a corner. So there's two sides of light minimum, Uh you know, obviously a freestanding building is even better, but it was like, we're never going to take a building that doesn't have great light and that it's democratized where it's like, everyone gets some of that. It's not like, The people next to the window get it and then everyone else is in the dark. So that plus making everything glass, which was kind of like a seemed like a dumb idea in 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 at the time, in the sense that it was so basic. But when I was in like psych 101 at Colorado College, um, we learned just about familiarity. And they said that like people who are familiar with each other are more likely to be friendly with each other. Mm -hmm. People actually like like find people more attractive who they're familiar with, you know, there's all these benefits of familiarity. So I thought if everything's glass and everyone can see each other, that will over time build up the chance. It's like if we've seen each other's face eight times, but we've Uh never spoken. Well, now we happen to see each other on the elevator out in the wild, you know, at a restaurant. We're going to be like, Oh, I know you like you're the guy from down the hall. Right. So that familiarity would over time would build up this um, potential for a connection. And then, you know, from there, we learned to try to create spaces that were actually designed. We call it center of gravity, but spaces where sort of all paths lead to the same place. Because at the time, there was a lot of residential was getting to be competitive. And there was a lot of these cool buildings where they made awesome amenities, right? Mm-hmm. Like you put on the roof or second floor, the awesome gym and like the big TV and the pool table. And you go into these places, there's literally no one there ever, right? So it's like, they're doing something wrong there. They're spending all this money to make the amenity, which checks some box, some box, like when you whatever rent or buy, but then it has no value beyond that. So what we wanted to figure out is like, there's obviously a good intent, but it's something's missing. So how can we create a way that you just naturally flow? And that to me became something I'm still really curious about, which is just thresholds and how we make decisions about things, because obviously we don't always make decisions that are good for us, Uh right? Even though we might think like, oh yeah, it would be great to go um, hang out in the common area. If you have to like get on an elevator and go up six floors, yeah, probably not going to do it. You know, like you're just lazy for the most part, mentally even, like regardless of like Uh the energy to walk there, it's oftentimes you're just mentally lazy to make the decision. So the idea was to remove threshold conditions where you don't ever have a decision. You just flow. Like you just happen to, it's on your way to wherever you're going, by the way. And then that just happens and that you have a lot of different places to go. So let's try to make those, let's try to make those spaces multifunctional. And then let's try to present a lot of options in those spaces because, you know, I'll, I, there are great speakers who speak at WeWork all the time. Mm-hmm. If I get the email saying, cool speaker, four o'clock, am I going to go like put that on my calendar? I'm going to go to the speaker maybe once in a while. But a lot of time I'm going to be like, even though I signed up, I'm too busy to go. But if I just happen to be walking by and I'm like, oh, wait, who's that? Uh-huh. Oh, that's cool. Pause, listen for a few minutes. Whoa, this is actually really interesting. You know, this is cool. Maybe I'll hang out and linger longer. Then I can like accidentally be connected to something right. that could actually have a really interesting effect on me. And so that's been a really like, there are a lot of those things where it's like, it's actually annoying in both cases for the people to have to have the speaker in the space because there's all these people wandering mm-hmm. around. And then uh, you know, versus an auditorium where it's like everyone's closed up. And then on the same, on the other side, it's like if you're in your office and there's a speaker, it could be annoying because like, but those are some of the risks we are willing to take of like, right. let's, you know, have the speaker 
let's play the World Cup game in the common area, even though there's going to be some people. And we still get the emails like, so stupid. Why is there a soccer game on in the common area? I'm trying to work, you know? Yeah. But those are the trade-offs in like the overall net benefit, which we believe, yeah, you're annoyed and you're trying to make your phone call. And, and you know, we understand. But overall, it goes back to the same thing. Everything's glass. What are the first people who come in do? First thing, can I cover the glass? Right. Almost everybody, uh-huh. right? Can't cover the glass because if I uh-huh. let you cover it, then the next person come in. They uh-huh. want to cover it too. And soon we've completely lost that benefit that was fundamental to but the But there's got to be instances in which people do want to have a private meeting, right? Yeah, and we want to provide yeah. for that. There's a bunch of functions we want to provide for. So that's a, that's a big part of a revolution is how do we actually make spaces that are supportive of lots of different work uh-huh. types. And that could be like the phone booth, which we added – probably in building two or three because we knew people need a private conversation or it could be the nook, which is one of the most popular little spaces for two people to hang out. Um, You know, or we've evolved conference rooms over time to have different sizes and shapes. And, you know, we added boardrooms, which we didn't have in the beginning. We added classrooms and, you know, now we have in some buildings meditation rooms. So it's like we're continuously evolving that collection of supportive functions and we're still working on it. We're still trying to figure it out. Well, I think that at least in Los Angeles and perhaps in a location or two in New York, you should have a dedicated soundproof studio space for people to do a podcast. I mean, everybody's a creator, right? Yeah. All these YouTube, everyone's (laughs) creating their audio visual content in one form or another, particularly in this town and certain other towns. But you know that is a trend, right? Yeah. And and I've been in the, I've done podcasts in, in in various WeWork conference rooms, and I'm like, they should just have like one room that you can reserve that is quieter than the rest, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You guys got to do that. Okay. Well, <laughs> let me um, explain that one a little <laughs> yeah. bit. Um, I can't be the first person to. So first of bring all, building number two in New York, Empire uh-huh. State opened with a screening room, literally the second building we had opened with a screening room and a recording studio to support these Uh uh, functions. And then first building in Hollywood had editing suites and screening room and stuff. Oh, it did, Uh uh-huh. So, cool, but you people who record podcasts, um, you start to get a little specific about the things that you Uh, need. Not everyone wants the same thing, you know, like you have your lights and like your camera set up and then there's some technical need that you have Uh that this doesn't fulfill. And now we need our own manager of that technology in those spaces, one. And we also need in some way a different sales function because we're Mm -hmm. used to selling workspace uh-huh. And you want a podcast room, right? So I don't. Right. We don't have a dedicated person who knows how to connect to and sell to. So we make these spaces. They're fine, I think. Uh-huh. They're not perfect. And then we don't have a person or a, we don't have a separate website for the person who needs a podcast recording studio, right? Yeah. Like, so sounds really simple. We're still working on it. How do you think about the nature of work? Itself. I mean, I would imagine you put a lot of thought into this because this is the business that you're in. And we're in a situation in which the tectonic plates of, of, you know, what the workplace is, what it looks like, what it means to, quote unquote, like go to work are really in flux. So how does, you know, what is the philosophy that you hold around that? Like, where do you see it going? And, and you know, what is the future of work? Work is the harder part. What we need as humans, as people, as social beings, I think, is the part that we think we can play a really important part of. So regardless of whether there's displacement by AI or efficiency or other efficient systems or robots, who knows what it is, or or perhaps even just, you know, the ways that people are effective and efficient in their own you know, way, way mm-hmm. that they work. Like if they're, if their knowledge or brain power is the most important thing and they don't need that for as many hours as, of a day as we currently think of it, who knows what that, how that will change. But what we feel really confident is that we need this. Like we need the human connection of mm-hmm. being face to face and spending time with other people. Um, so I think that we're going to keep building that social, emotional, communal, communitarian infrastructure Uh to be supportive of whatever those work models 
evolve to be, right? Because they'll continue to change over right. time. But we know that like what happens next to that will continue to be really important. So when you look at something like Flatiron School, like Flatiron School, really awesome school. They're amazing at um, teaching students in real life. And we're able to add community to that. And it's great. But it's not and it's like we can do a lot of locations, but it still won't be scalable to the masses, right? Uh-huh. But Flatiron as an online learning program can actually be effective because we can take the people who are learning online and create that community and support that community of those learners in a whole bunch of different places where we don't have an actual physical physical location of a school, right? So I think that's where education may be changing. Work might be changing, uh, you know, the way we eat is changing. Lots of things are evolving, but, but what will we always we still, need? We still need to be able to connect with yeah. each other in real life. And we need to get way, way, mm-hmm. way better at that. Like we're still doing it at a, at a, at a minimal rate, right? We're still, there are still so few of us who have one hour of a day where we feel like uh-huh. it's that fulfillment of connection. Yeah. Now, huge emerging part of our business is working with large companies to do to create a similar environment of openness, of connection, of creativity, of innovation, because that's what all the companies are aware that maybe not all, a lot I mean, of like, them, like a large company would contact you and say, "Help us figure out how to reconfigure our workspace." Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They have to change. They have to change their workplace. They have to change their culture. They have to change the way it feels to work at that company. And so, we're really excited to be a part of something like that because. If they don't, they just continue to do this the same way right. they've always done it, right? They'll and we just, know that's not the right just, path for you know, the for yeah, all of our just future. Become antiquated, and, and they'll just the they'll fight. Way. They'll fight really hard to keep doing it the way that it's been done, uh-huh. right? And they, they, you know they'll do that because their sh- shareholders will require it of them up into a certain point, right? But at the same time, they need to be a part of the solution, right? And we believe we can help. We believe we can be a part of that kind of transformation. So you guys have recently embarked on this We Live initiative where now you're creating living spaces. What do you have them in, like New York and D.C.? Yeah, New York and D.C., they've been around for a couple of years. We're gonna, we have one in Seattle that will uh, open soon. Um, and, and they're then, like studios or all the way up to like literally almost like communal living spaces with multiple bedrooms around a shared living space? Or yeah. how does it work? Yeah, I mean, we're still in the ones that we have. There are, you know, I believe up to four bedroom units or four bed uh-huh. units. Um, and we're, you know, we're really experimenting with that on multiple levels because um, the, in different regions, there are different ways, you know, that code allows you to do different things. So um, in New York, there are more restrictions, although there the government's actually working on evolving that. But, um, you know, we're trying to apply some of those same principles. Like, again, there's something about residential where it's like, you know, you feel in an apartment, you enter the building, go up in the elevator, the hall is empty, a uh-huh. bunch of closed doors, you go in your apartment, and that's it. You don't have any connective tissue. There's nothing that draws you in. So ideally, we would create some of those same um, environments that are threshold-free or with reduced threshold, so you just flow into other potential um, connections. And are they all in the in buildings where you have WeWork office space as well? Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. all integrated. So it's almost like in the way that Apple created this ecosystem, I mean, closed off is the wrong connotation, but like kind of this world in which you can inhabit, this is this feels like a similar thing. Like you can enter the We the We uh well you've read what's the new name that you guys have read well, the, the We company, company. The We yeah. Company mm-hmm experience to live, to work, to eat, to work out or whatever it is, which is like, (laughs) that's like, that's like, I mean, talk about like big vision. That's like a huge vision. Yeah. Um, We just had an initiative that was made public, which it was We Cities initiative. Uh Uh-huh. and it's an entire city that you would design an entire well, city. Well, I don't know what it means exactly, uh-huh. but I think if you again, there's something about it which can be like, whoa, those people are crazy. They want to yeah. like take over everything. And then, and I keep getting back to why. And this was part of the start of our conversation is like, what do we need to be really mm-hmm. good at? We need to help people in real life, face to face, 
make connections to fight disconnection, loneliness, depression, plagues of our time, right? So you could look at it from the like Frank Lloyd Wright perspective, which was design everything and yeah. like control the user and even determine what clothes they're wearing inside of the home that you develop, right? Yeah. That's not what we're trying to to promote. But at the same time, we would love to have influence on people for a really fundamentally important reason, you know, which is to increase well, that that possibility. Yeah, it's it's audacious and it's bold, but it's also beautiful because the truth is we are starved for that connection. We're in an epidemic of depression and, you know, drug addiction and anxiety and stress. And we really are dying to be more connected. And a big kind of contributor to this affliction is the way that society has kind of, you know, created these environments in which we live and work, right? So the idea that, hey, let's, if you were going to design a brand new city and it's all about, it's all going to facilitate connectivity, connection, and community, like what would that look like? Like there's, there's, Yes, there's an idealism built into that, but there's also something that's pretty cool. Like, what would that city look like? And I can tell you some of my happiest moments were when I was a college student. I was on an athletic team Mm -hmm. where I was super close to these people that I spent a tremendous amount of time with. And then I would go back to my dorm or these suites where I lived or a house that I shared with other people. And we did spend a tremendous amount of time in these common areas and the doors were always open. And that sense of feeling connected to other human beings in an environment that was conducive to like learning and growing is a really amazing thing. And I, I, I would like more of that in my life now. So when I hear about, you know, we live and you could like move to New York and like immediately tap into like this situation that's community oriented and then work, I feel like I was born out of time. Like I wish I was... <laughs> you know, 23 right now, and I could go experience that because I feel as an adult, you know, now I don't have as much of that in my life as I would like. And I know that I would be a happier, more fulfilled person if I did have more of that. And I know most people would as well. Everybody would, right? Yeah. Well, it's weird because when we first started, we lived there were some almost derogatory evaluation saying like, it's dorms for adults. Yeah. But I kind of like, like, I'd be like stoked to move back into um, a dorm. I mean, in a way it's like, like, wow, there's some really good, like. Right. I like living in a dorm. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, I'm sure there are some people who don't. And there are downsides, which again, with design, perhaps we can figure out how to reconcile. But yeah, it's like the good parts of that are amazing. Like Uh so good. And also the, you know, the free flowingness of like not having to like text and plan Uh and like, okay, I'll meet you over there, you know, and everything is, you know, kid play dates and every, you know, everything's just so structured. It's like when you're in the dorm, it's like, you're just rolling through life, you know, and like bumping into people and who knows what's going to happen, you know, next. And I think that's something that like, people look at that, like that's somehow an immature way of living or something. And that's weird. Like, it's really weird that like we somehow created this construct where we're like Grow up. growing up means go live in a wall isolated your, wall yourself off. Yeah. yeah. Like why? I know it's so weird. And I mean, I'm sure I, uh, there's plenty of reasons why it happened, but I think now that, that the problem is, is that it is very hard to change because it's actually, like you said, very expensive infrastructure uh-huh. that supports this way of living that we have now. Yeah. Right. So, um, and residential is harder than, than, than work. And that's one of the reasons why we've been able to scale. We work very quickly because, you know, on any, we work floor, there's one set of bathrooms, right. Yeah. And, you know, one kitchen yeah. and then a whole bunch of highly efficient space, uh-huh. you know, apartments get more complicated to build and, you know, there's way more plumbing stacks and, HVAC issues and all these kind of things. So from an execution perspective, they're very different. But the but again, the foundational why behind them is, is um, can be so similar. So if you were to design a We City, let's say you could start from scratch, like what is it? You know, what does that look like? You know, it's a great question because I I mean I've we were talking about that this today because I drove to work for the first time in my life today. Uh-huh. Um, we were in LA and. 
you know, everyone drives. So we were like, we rented a Tesla, um, which I hadn't driven a Tesla before. That's a pretty and great I, I've been in one, but I hadn't uh-huh. driven. I'm like, I mean, the gas pedal, like, it's like a roller coaster yeah. a little bit, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I drove to work. I like went into the parking garage and I suck at all of that. Like, I didn't know. I just, I didn't remember where I parked. Like, I didn't pay attention. Anyway, I'm just bad at like all stuff related <laughs> yeah. to cars. I'm really uh-huh. terrible. But, um, but point is, is that um, I've always been, you know, uh, walking, biking, subwaying now. And I really love that. And so I think that there's like the first thing I think transit and transportation is just a huge part of any mm-hmm. city. And when that, you know, so the first time I heard about autonomous cars and even Uber as a, as a, as a idea that no one would ever park. And then someone said, think of a city where no one ever parks. That was one of the coolest yeah. things I heard about the future of cities um, because um, obviously it's cool to think of other ways of transit. But even just the fact that our streets could be liberated from all these cars and what could you use the space for. And I mean, L.A., you just imagine like if you made – I mean just the scooter lane yeah. could be amazing here and take half the people out of their cars and put them on those cool scooters. I mean – and make it safe for him. So anyway, mm-hmm. that's not as visionary as we would need to get to. And and I haven't I haven't indulged in it um, enough. But I do think that what what I think would would one of the things that would be fundamentally different is that we would just be much less governed by the typical systems of time in the way that we usually work now, which is like you wake up in the morning, do your routine, get to work, spend whatever number of hours that is, you know, eight or 10 hours Uh a day, you go to home, you have dinner, you work out, you go to bed, right? Like I think that there's, for me at least, um, being much more free flowing about that. You know, we're really untethered. We can be really untethered ideas can come and efficient working could come in all kinds of different times, places, and spaces. So if you can imagine just a network of, like you you said, you know, when you're working at home, I'm sure you have the times where it's like one space really works for you, but and it's great and you're engaged and it's there's other people around and there's a buzz. Mm-hmm. And then other times you got to get completely out. You got to yeah. be in your own private box, you know. And so if you can imagine a city working that way where it's much, it's less more about, binary, um, you know, I'm in or I'm out, but much more about a spectrum. And you're always existing in some kind of different spectrum of entertainment, work, health, life. You know, we talk about walking meetings, trying to promote that. So it's like just this much more spectrum-oriented, threshold-free environment that just feels like I'm alive all the time. I'm doing good stuff all the time. I'm in a good mental mindset all the time. Not like switch into this, switch into that, switch. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think that's. I don't know. I think that we show up. I mean, my feeling is that we 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 would we could show up differently if we were like that. Like if we were just much more free, rather than compartmentalized. Well, there's no question about that. I mean, you know, our cities, our urban landscapes were designed in a different time with different priorities, and a lot of them without much mindfulness whatsoever. I mean, Los Angeles is a perfect example of that. Like it just went up and now it's here and we're dealing with, you know, so many problems that are that could have been resolved at the inception had it been, you know, had it been well thought out and planned from the outset. Yeah. And and, you know, with what we know now, if like you could just wipe it out and start over, you know, imagine how much better it could be. What's weird about L.A. Now. coming from New York is that, like, the assets of L.A. are, like, so amazing. You yeah. know, like, it's like in New York, it's not like you're going to go find this incredible canyon or, like, a beautiful um, orange tree that, you know, or, like, a, a garden or, you know what I mean? It's like it's you're, you're finding urban everywhere. But, but it takes you two hours to go 15 miles. Right, exactly. So you may or never, you ne- not even get to those things. Like you may close your mind to the idea that you're even going to experience that diversity. But if you can imagine like incredible high speed, you know, transit here um, and super convenient public transportation, and it would be like, oh, yeah, I'm going right. to be on the mountain or at the beach or, you know, 
wherever that might be and like and it doesn't and it feels frictionless then this would be like the wonderland yeah. you know we'll get on that <laughs> <laughs> small problem to solve <laughs> all right well green desk was conceived with this environmental sensibility um and now you're kind of starting to explore that with we work you announced this meatless initiative that made a lot of news all around the world um, which I thought was amazing. I would imagine that was a risky maneuver for you guys. It's a bold statement um, and it's super cool. So can you kind of talk about what went into um, making that decision? Yeah, it's interesting because the motivation on some level was not about, not necessarily about me itself, but about accountability and about you know personal choices and the impact that we have and um and these things have come up over time not about meat but about like paper you know or uh-huh. energy like our lights you know being on and why don't our, you know and adam to his credit is very aware all the time of like inefficiency like he sees things and he's like i walk down the street and the lights are on at a we work building why are they on you know uh-huh. this has got to be a waste of energy and um and he's paying attention to these things all the time. And then we're looking for like, okay, what switches in your mind where you start to care about these things rather than just like walking past them without thinking about it. And um, so we had, I mean, Adam's uh, uh, um, fearless leader doesn't have any like worry about saying or doing things that, um, you know, would be uh, controversial. And so um, we were discussing, like, what are the things that we could do that would increase, Uh you know, personal accountability? And that one came up and it wasn't actually, you know, a big, we didn't think of it as a huge decision. Um, I mean, I I think he knew in saying it for the first time that it would actually, people would be like, whoa, Um, I actually didn't. I was just like, oh yeah, that's like, I was like, whoa, I can't believe that he actually said it because he said Uh it when it was still, you know, TBD of to whether we it wasn't like a fully baked idea. Yeah, it wasn't like we prepared the whole comms (laughs) team and Uh like you know prepared a whole um, thing. And that's the way we've done a lot of stuff over time is just instinct and intuition and just like right time, just do something, you know. Um, But it was part of an overall discussion in about that personal accountability. And so um, I took that as like this is amazing because it actually is a spike that pretty much nothing else would get, you know, like you can ask people to like be more aware of their choices in a lot of other areas of life. And it's kind of, eh, you know, like we've, we also have eliminated plastic from our operations. Right. And like, you know, it's easy to forget and you still go out to the local deli or whatever and come back with a bag full of, you know, plastic flatware or whatever. And, but meat has been, you don't forget that one. You know, it yeah. comes up in your brain. It's like if you're going out to dinner, you know, you're going to remember that that was something. And then you have to ask yourself, what do you do with that information? And I think what we've seen, I'm sure some people could care less. They've gone and lived their life normally. But we've also seen a lot of people are like, this is the first time I've ever thought about that before. This right. is the first time I've ever understood the implications of my choices when it comes to food. Mm-hmm. And that's the stuff I get super excited about is yeah. that we've also heard people say, hey, I've talked to my family about it. It's influenced the way that we eat as a family. I have a really good friend who sends me pictures all the time of their family eating you know, vegetarian. And, 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 and it sounds like kind of crazy, but like their kids who are you know, 19, 20, whatever – who are like really proud vegetarians and vegans because of our influence. They're not even WeWork members. They just happen to be friends, but they're just, they connected to it. So that's the stuff that I think actually will have a ripple effect, Uh you know? Have you seen that ripple effect uh, in other corporate cultures? Well, like you kind of broke the seal on that. It comes up. It's come up in different contexts. So one of the examples is that, you know, I, um, You know, in talking to leaders in both HR, other business fields, we're we get I get the feeling that we're creating space for other for conversations, right? So if if people look at us as like the crazy ones Mm -hmm. who are doing the wild stuff, and we're also thought of as like a cool company that people know about, um, and they can say, "Hey, look, we're in. We want to hire the same talent that WeWork is going to get. Look at what." 
people who work there care about, like they're mission driven, they're purpose driven. We need to find that too, right? What are the signals that we can find within ourselves that are going to put us yeah. in a place where we can even be on the close to the same page as them, right? So I haven't seen anyone else go so far as, um, but you know, I've been in a lot of conversations where people have said, hey, we're thinking about something like that. We're thinking about doing something. And I'm very like, I mean, I'll, I'll, I've gotten, you know, a lot of knowledge in conversations with people to in understanding how like misaligned uh, companies are in terms of the efforts that they make. So, you know, you can have a company like a big bank who has said, we have a new $200 million fund to invest in, you know, green technology. And we believe wholeheartedly that, you know, we have to uh, support innovation in this area or else we're all screwed, right? So they can say that. Yeah. And then I'll be like, so have you guys, are you guys still eating meat in your cafeteria? Yeah. And they're like, what do you, what, what, you know, what, what are you talking about? Yeah, and I'm they're like, not well, connecting the dots on it. This all come mm-hmm. all ties together. And then also say, you know, what, what do you, what's, you know, what, what is your CSR program, your impact program look like? And they're like, oh, oh, wait a minute. Like it, that doesn't all uh-huh. come together. And I think that's the kind of thing which we're excited about being in those conversations. Yeah, just be able to, to initiate that conversation and get people thinking about it a little bit differently and, and start being mindful of like working towards some, uh, you know, form of carbon neutrality or working towards, you know, reducing that carbon footprint. Yeah. And I, and I would say one thing that I've, one of the effective techniques and i promote it for other people who are conveners or people who gather smart people. One of the things that I've been saying is that whenever you're bringing people together where food is not the point, meaning you're not going to a place to eat the best blank steak or whatever it is, or, you know, or you're bringing together thought leaders who should be able to at least understand that there's something bigger going on here, then make those events meat free make those the time when you don't serve meat because it's not like you know people are really protective of like grandma's meatballs or whatever you know they're like we're not going to give that up like our family needs that but like the like chicken breast and steak at like a crappy catered event that's not even really the meal yeah like who cares it's like that's pointless that's nothing to do with Uh why you're there right so most people have received that i've gotten a few immediate reactions of like fuck off, what are you talking about? And then- You're trying to police my life. Exactly. But you're not, you're just saying we're not going to pay for it. Well, in our our case, yeah, we're not going to pay for it. We're not going to be a part of, you know, the consumption. But I think there's the other level of, you know, if you're appealing to people who are smart people, who care, they might not be ready to make that leap themselves. But I think that you can at least say- I mean, we know like reducitarian is a thing, right? Like uh-huh. it would make a huge difference if we just had less consumption. So look for those opportunities to consume less. Yeah. And then that will, the collectively, if that spreads, we change the expectations of like, you know, what we need from those kind of events. And then those are all business leaders who care. Okay, now their mind is open. Why don't we have meat? Here's why. Oh, wow. Okay. Have you, I mean, because you're doing this, on such a huge scale, have you run the numbers on this is the amount of water that we're going to save? This is the carbon emissions that we're sparing. Yeah, this is I the number of that stuff. animals. I mean, there's got to be stats on that. We've right? done some of that. I'm like, so not the numbers person. Uh-huh. Um, um, Adam has definitely commissioned those um, reports and right. the numbers are big. Coffee is a huge one, which we're trying to figure out because, you know, the implications of coffee are big and we serve right. a lot. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of study of our supply chain to try to understand where things come from. And, our, you know, we have um, a team that's a sustainability team that I um, am already super impressed with trying to create, uh, you know, uh, not only understand where things come from, but where do they go after they come into our uh, buildings. And we're looking at ways that we can always keep them inside. So, you know, and this is a long-term thing, but saying once something comes into a WeWork building, it never leaves, whatever that might be. Uh Um, I don't, we don't know for sure what that means yet, but that's what we're looking at is that circular, you know, path. And then also um, really, really understanding. We have a wood desk, we have wood flooring, you know, where does it come from? Um, All the building materials. So 
And the cool thing about our scale is that we can actually be, you know, market movers in that way, right? Yeah. So it's like our buying decisions could have influence. And that's something I'm trying to learn more about. Um, I've yeah. heard some great stories from people who have been empowered by that, who have, uh-huh. they've known that they have, say, a huge power requirement for a factory or whatever. And they're able to influence, you know, government in a country to say, I'll build the wind farm, you update the grid to deliver mm-hmm. me my renewable power, mm-hmm. for example. And that's the kind of stuff I'm getting excited. It's a very early stage for us, but that's the kind of stuff I get excited about of saying, like, at scale, we could now influence, you know, a municipality. Right. We're gonna or roll a city. into this country or this city that we haven't been in before, but here's what's gonna have to happen. Exactly. That's like real power. Yeah, and think <laughs> of it, and I mean there's so many downstream implications uh, of that that can be so positive if if you, you know, look at the ways that um you know, cities care about economic development. They are motivated by jobs. They're motivated by, uh-huh. you know, things that, so So if we say we're going to build something locally, whether that's a sofa or a chair or a desk or light fixtures or whatever, you know, you're talking about pretty good good amount of um, economic yeah. potential there, right? So I that can actually move the needle. You guys have announced that you are you have this goal of being carbon neutral by like, I don't know, 2030 or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, 2023. 2023. Yeah. Which is um, actually, you know, it's not that hard in the places where renewable power is available. Uh It's very difficult in the places where it, you know, where the grid is not, you know, if you don't have a grid that gets the power into the city and we're Mm -hmm. in the city, you know, we're going to be facing challenges there. But those those are challenges where, again, we're just super excited about engaging Mm in. Um, I don't have all those answers. But but um, but I think like a year from now we're gonna have a really awesome story to tell about that and how we're figuring it out. And then also add, we believe we can be a convener of other companies. So if we're talking about scale, it's like you know, other companies who want to be purpose driven, mission driven, care about the future, believe in their role in helping with climate change. If we're the convener of those companies, and now we say, hey, look, we've got. Out of all the office buildings in downtown, we could get twenty percent of them. Mm. Now that's even you know more right. buying power right, right, that right. could move you know things to happen, right? So that's the stuff that we get excited about, um, and that could apply in you know different places, like we said, from transportation. We're looking at things in LA of like what we could do point to point between buildings to reduce driving, um, things like that. So yeah. a lot of future there, which should be fun. How important do you think it is in in 2019 for for you know young entrepreneurs, people that are starting businesses, to think in terms of you know triple bottom line values? Well, you know it's weird because I exist in that world, so I thought everyone was that yeah. way already. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, uh-huh. I had a conversation yesterday uh, with a woman, Julie Hanna, who um, I'm coming to know and really appreciating. She's an early technologist and entrepreneur in the um, Bay Area, who's an investor in a lot of um, different companies. And, you know, she was seeing it differently. She's like, you know, maybe if we're lucky it's 50-50 um, in terms mm-hmm. of like mercenary versus mm-hmm. missionary. What's the advice that you give to young people looking to start businesses? Like what have you, I mean, you've blazed this extraordinary entrepreneurial path. You know, what have you learned from that? Well, That's- I I used to say this differently, but I was talking to, um, I, I had a, event with Sean King a couple of weeks ago. And he had this cool framing where he said, you have to, and I hope I'll say it the right way. He said, you need to find out, find what you love to do. And then you need to find what you really care about. And if those two things match up, meaning if you can use what you love to do to address what you really care about, then you will have found your thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for me, I hadn't heard it in that way exactly before, but if you look at it for me, it's like, I feel like I really cared about human centered design. I really cared about, I really love design. I love the process of like rigorous problem solving. Like that was my, I would do it without getting paid, right? Which is always like the thing, like what would you do? If you find the thing you would do without being paid, And then you apply that to a business problem, which is that workspace sucked, people are disconnected, you know, everyone's lonely. That was a, you know, perfect connection point for for me. So that's what I would encourage people to do is look for really to understand, like, where does their core 
the depth of their being. Where does where do, what do they what do they love to do? What would they do if they're not getting paid? And then how does that apply to an actual business problem, a social problem, uh-huh. something that they feel really passionate about being a part of changing? And that I think once you find that, then it's like it doesn't really matter the scale of the business or the level of success or, you know, like you become a millionaire or all that other shit doesn't really matter anymore because now you're just existing in this place where you're doing something that feels like a full expression of yourself. Yeah. And if you can, if you can match that with a problem that really needs to get solved, right. Where, where there's a service component to it and a need. Yeah. And that's, that's why I would say like, don't start another photo sharing app. You know what I mean? Like, no one needs that. Mm-hmm. What do we need? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> you're going to start over. Well, I mean that you know that there, there's there's a lot of slices, and we I think we're again like the world that I live in. I think that we see a lot of people finding that slice, and um, and it comes in weird forms. I mean, our creator awards, which we uh, give out to companies that are and efforts. I mean, you know, nonprofit, for profit. Uh-huh. We say creators because they're not necessarily entrepreneurs in the similar sense. It could be artists, whatever it could be. But in Creator Awards, the winner this last year was a company that does something that seems really kind of weird. But they, they're basically like a marketplace for used medical equipment. Mm. And that sounds not so awesome at its, you know, without understanding it too well. But the way I understand it is that, you know, they're through taking underutilized medical equipment from hospitals that have already like upgraded to their new MRI machine or whatever. Now they've got this old one just collecting dust in the corner. If you can actually make that one available to a hospital that can buy it at a discounted rate that doesn't have an MRI machine at all in some, you know, smaller town that, you know, used to be like you have Mm. to drive two hours, like you've actually done something to support a small community and their health, for example, Right. right? And those are the kind of things where it's like, People, you know, that's a really narrow slice of uh-huh. the business world, but it's actually doing something impactful. And I think that's what what we get excited about is that there's so many, if you're thinking about it in the right way and your motivation is really to do good, there's a lot of opportunity. You know, there's a lot of places to find um, right. something that's not what gets the like headline of like yeah. the hottest new startup, you know? You seem like a, a super grounded dude. How do you, yeah, is he, he's like looking around. Are you, is he not? Like, you're pretty chill, dude, for like, you know, you could be, you know, rocking an, a, a different kind of lifestyle. You know what I mean? You don't seem like you're, you seem like you have a very um, uh, healthy relationship with your ego. I can hear the humility in your voice and you, you truly, you know, come across as mission-driven and value-based in your approach to your life and your business. So, you know, how, to what do you attribute that? Or like, how do you like maintain that sense of self? And that's something I, I mean, I've been trying to um, figure out in different times because it's, it's hard to understand. But like, like I've had some of the weirdest questions in that way. Like there was this one guy um, who literally walked up to me one day and he was like one of our employees and he goes, hey, man, I just really wanted to ask you this. Like, how are you, you? Uh-huh. And I'm like, like how are you supposed like, to answer um, that question? I'm like, yeah. um, and I'm like, what? Can you expand on that? And he's like, he's just like, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Like, you're like, you know, you're like so successful, you, you know, like it, it's just not what people expect. But I don't mm-hmm. know exactly what, I don't have a counterpoint in my own brain of what I could be, right? Like, I'm just myself. So it's hard to like, um, I don't, invi- I can't perceive a different me, right? Other people do. Yeah. And they, their people can be like surprised or disarmed or like, well, this guy's different than I expected, but I don't have that. So I, all I can, you know, the thing that I get to is that what I feel really good about is that, and I, and I, and I'm trying to, I am trying to understand why, but I just feel like really comfortable being myself all the time. You know, I feel like I'm my authentic self, no matter whether I'm talking to you and mm-hmm. it's recorded and there's cameras or whether I'm speaking in front of, you know, doing a commencement address in front of my, you know, at my university or whether it's speaking to someone who literally just like grabbed me at the airport and was like, Hey, are you Miguel? And I'm like, 
Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I think. Um, I wasn't <laughs> expecting anyone to know who I uh-huh. was, but I am. And have a, having an authentic connection with that person, not just being like put off by that. And I think, um, I don't know why that is. I just feel really good about it. Like uh-huh. I feel like really, and, and, I, and I believe that once I felt it, I've indulged in it. Like I've been like, you know what? I'm not going to ever believe that I have to put on some other face. Yeah. I just won't do it. Well, it's nice and it's refreshing, uh, you know, in in a in a kind of period of time that we're in right now where, you know, the Elizabeth Holmes story is, you know, top of mind with the documentary oh, and all that? that. I just watched it. And I, wa- I listened to the like six part podcast series too, which is like amazing. It's fantastic. I'm like obsessed. And the fire Festival documentaries and all of this, mm. where you see these, you know, these quote unquote, you know, entrepreneurs that have, you know, their ego spiral out of control and, and there is no connection with authenticity and they're not grounded. And, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, these are journeys that began with good intentions, but, you know, trajectories that spiraled out of control. Yeah. I, I mean, I have to attribute a big part of that to, being partners with Adam and him giving me the freedom to be myself because I didn't always have to show up in front of everyone, Mm. you know? So he was the face when we're talking to early investors, you know, he still has the high level relationships with people where it really, you know, that, funding and financing that you've referenced, which is to an extraordinary um, amount, you know, when you judge it from the outside, you know, he's the one who's had to show up in some of these very, from the very beginning in high intensity um, exchanges situations. And I've been able to do my thing. You know, I was able to build up a credibility by, by, by being a part of that creative process of building the experience and the in the business and the brand and stuff like that in a way that just was very natural to me. I didn't, and then hatch something else from that, Uh you know? And I, and I, and so, you know, again, that goes back to that partnership of like, what were we able to do and what was some of the magic of it? It, it it allowed me to be me the the Uh whole way through. And I'm still, I still feel like I'm finding out who I am. I'm on the journey and I hope to continue to evolve. It's not like I'm like, I made it. So I still see it as like, okay, we're figuring it out. Like I have complex shit to deal with in my own head and I'm working on it. Yeah. You know? How do you uh instill these ideas in the in the management team? Like how does that how does that go downstream to make sure that that integrity remains intact? Well, for me, I mean that's a lot of just Leadership by example, meaning I just try to show up in every context that I can as my authentic self and mm-hmm. I promote that. Um, I will say it's not like a really proactive like like leader circle as an example, which I did this morning with the local leadership team here in L.A. That's an exercise which we did just to find vulnerability and share stories and um, be ourselves, hopefully our authentic selves for two hours out of our lives, our busy week, our day, whatever. But I think that that kind of um, connection is one means something to yourself, then it means something to those around you. And then there's something that just going through that exercise of connecting to yourself will flow to the people who as leaders now to their teams, right? I don't know if they'll conduct the leadership circle. I hope they do. It'd be cool if they did. But just the fact that they got in touch with themselves I think will help them show up differently. And so that's a lot of what I try to do is conduct those kind of experiences where they where you get into something that perhaps you aren't normally asked for in right. your regular business life. And um and and that's something which again I, I think it's like practicing what I preach to some extent of actually making time for those kind of experiences. And we do it, you know, if I go to Seoul, we do it with a group of leaders there. When we, you know, go to another city, it's like, that's the exercise that we do as well as other things, but um, make time for that. Uh And, uh, um, you know, Adam is a, and and I also, you know, at all company meetings, I will try to connect people to context and give us perspective about where we are and, and how we should, how we show up. 
But Adam also plays a role of being, you know, a visionary leader from a much more specific side, you know, meaning like here are our business goals, talk about our growth, you know, talking about how we as individuals have to perform in order to reach these big goals that we're setting for ourselves and what does it take, you know, as a person to show up in this yeah. equation. So it's still a play, you know, it's still a play. And mm-hmm. I don't I don't have a lot of like specific accountability for that stuff. It's not like I'm running a leadership program. It's like I'm just trying to embody it. And that's why it's so cool to be in both of those places at the same time. It's like we do something really hard. We make spaces for people to exist in. People are a pain in the ass, right? They, never, Same they, they don't. They don't do what you want them to do. Air conditioning. One person's <laughs> hot. One person cold. Uh, sitting this close to each other. Right. <laughs> Maximize that to half a million people around the world. You're, you're the biggest human resources, uh, you know. It's department so, in the world. Exactly, and they're yeah. not your employees, right? If all the people work for you, it's like you just go, "Hey, just take it." You know, you're uh-huh. like, you're, you know, it's like. But these are people <laughs> who are paying us their yeah. monthly membership fee. So they're like, uh-huh. if I'm paying the fee, I want it the temperature that makes me comfortable, which is a totally fair assumption, uh-huh. right? It's hard sometimes to negotiate with a person like that who's like, yeah, but but the person next to you. So anyway, um, so that's hard every day, delivering hot coffee, making the bathrooms work, you know, cleaning the bathroom, um, having a smile on your face every day mm-hmm. as a community manager when the member walks in, you know, the, these are things that are in a, a very difficult business to execute again at scale with great speed. But then like, what are you a part of that makes all of that worthwhile? It has to be something way bigger. You got to feel like if you're like on the front lines in like Jakarta and you are opening a building and all you've got is your local team and you're like, we got to open on the first of the month no matter what because members are moving in. I mean, that is a stressful situation for them. And they're far away from, you know, they don't get to see what's going on at our HQ in New York and feel that energy. They're a small team that's so far. And yet they feel like they're doing something that matters. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're actually moving the world forward when they open those doors and the members come in, they believe they're doing something good. Right. And that's like, so that, that to me is a big part of my responsibility is to keep helping them connect to that Uh energy, you know? All right. Well, we got to wrap this up in a minute here, but uh, I I can't let you go without um, asking you how you, maintain balance in your own life as somebody whose whose job is to create workplaces and foster a healthier relationship with work like does it feel weird when that gets out of whack in your own life like how do you show up and be you know a loving and present partner and father um, while trying to like steward this like massive organization well, I will say that for a long time, I didn't do that well. Uh-huh. I think that I was unhealthy in the way I approached my life outside of work. I do think that for my son's life, I've really dedicated the right energy to him. But in other places, I think that I wasn't good at it. But um, I went through divorce and... I was re-establishing myself and who I am, and I met someone and fell in love with her, and she's amazing. And she shifted my appreciation for a whole other part of life that I just, to be honest, had completely ignored, and that was the enjoyment of, like, dinner or, you know— Actually enjoying it, not just eating it functionally, but like going out and enjoying it and like actually having some um, appreciation for like, and I still have to work on this. She knows that of like, how was your day? Uh You know, present, being present and and, 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 and care, but caring about that. Like I can, again, I can preach that at work, but then it's like at home, I can just be like, oh, you know, this is, I don't know, something else. I think I thought about it before as like, 
you know, recovery time almost as an athlete. It's like, this is the time to just like, you know, functionally repair, but not actually be present in, uh-huh. in a, in, that it has equal value in a way. And so that's been a huge shift for me. And I know, um, even, uh, Jillian, my assistant who I work with, she knows, and she's very good at helping me being much more aware of like making a schedule that, um, that helps me achieve more of this. I don't necessarily call it balance, but I would just say, cause I do think it's like a spectrum. It doesn't mean I'm not thinking about work at the time when I'm doing other things, but it is like just a greater level of awareness. Um, and, um, and then, so with Jesse and I, when we're together, I think that we try to be present with each other and that's a, re- and that's a commitment, which again, um, I feel I take seriously mm-hmm. and I, and I love it. Like it's I a get a lot of good. Yeah, it is a practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is. A, and when there's a lot of other inputs that could easily take over that, whether they're in work or they're just life or they're like, I mean, to be honest, we discuss like, do we listen to too many podcasts uh-huh. sometime? Cause you know, it's like, you feel yeah. like you need to learn and you need to grow and you have to like the, the latest amazing person is on rich roll. You got to listen to it, but it's two hours. You right. know, <laughs> we've gone two and a half today. Yeah. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, I encourage people to uh, listen to it, but at the same time, it's like, okay, at what point do you stop that consumption and actually be, yeah. you know, present? And yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. there's commute and other times you can do that, but it's like, um, but yeah, I think that that's, like you said, it's like, an, it's a practice and something to be as purposeful in that in life as you are at work and i think that will always you know that's always um an opportunity to do better try to find that you know purpose and and to and to be good at it like to try to be really good at it yeah good man it's good talking to you yeah i really have enjoyed this i always say like i learn from um these experiences because i learned from speaking which sounds really maybe self-absorbed but I feel like I learned a lot today. Well, the more that you, the more that you, <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, the more that you share your own story, the more it tells you what it is and what's important, right? Or you try to figure out like, well, what is it about that experience that could be helpful or meaningful in my own, in how I think about myself and how I communicate, right? I know that's been the experience in my case. Well, all I can tell you is, look, I know what it's like to, suffer in an insufferable work environment and to be in an, in an uninspiring, um, you know, architectural professional habitat. And I appreciate what you're doing, man. And you really have impacted the world in a way that few people on earth can say, and it's inspiring what you've built. And I can, you know, I can feel the intention behind it. And um, it's a beautiful thing, man. So wind in your sails, my friend. Thank you. Yeah. What's next? You know, we're actually trying to get into uh, Kanye's Sunday sermon. Oh, uh, nice! So, are we? That's you can be back out meeting. in Calabasas. Try to convince them that we're worthy of <laughs> yeah. um, of attendance. <laughs> <laughs> What's the we're angle? Late to the meeting. We we're late to dude. The if you can't get in, you know, yeah. come on. You should. You got to. You, I'm sure you could find a way to finagle that somehow. Uh, well, yeah, we're meeting with someone who works yeah. with Kanye, so we'll okay, see cool. if he uh, if he likes us enough. Yeah. Maybe he'll give us the awesome man. The, uh, the thumbs up. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> Miguel, uh, I appreciate you. Thanks, man. If people want to learn more uh, about your world, just go to WeWork, right? Is that the yeah. best? Any any other place? You, you're on Twitter, your name. I don't you use know, Twitter, Miguel, but. You don't really use it. Instagram a little, but. Uh-huh. I don't know. That's a really good question, yeah. and I should have a good answer to it, but I have no <laughs> idea how you're supposed to learn more about me. <laughs> I would Google, I I guess if people could Google you, right? Yeah. I think you should go on YouTube. I I think my, um, I like your, uh, your speech, your, your, my my commencement address has way too few views. Uh So I think that people should watch that. That's a good, I agree. I watched it. It is very authentic. I appreciated like the honesty and just the kind of like unabashed, like unpretentious way in which you showed up for that. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, man. All <laughs> right, dude. It. Come back and talk to me again sometime. I would love to. Peace. Peace.